Talk about it all here on the Jordy Colada Show. Make sure and hit that like button, share button, comment button. You know, one thing about Jaden that I've tried to talk to him about is tightening his chin strap. Because he doesn't tighten it. So every time he gets hit, it looks like his helmet's all messed up. And it's like, oh, God, he just got rocked. For the win! Caught! It's gone! LSU does it! After a fucking Saturday night in Tiger Stadium, boys! <laughs> Are you kidding me? Well, uh, LSU fan came and stuck his spike in my booty. <laughs> that ball was hard. Oh, oh, oh. Dan brought his two grandkids by and literally was just 30 seconds. Just wanted to say thank you for the team and the season and what you did and, and how much it means to everybody here is, is truly what makes LSU special. Yeah. Coach Kelly, we're official. Finally, I'm get Kelly. a chance to meet you. Thought I had to get a private audience with the Pope. There's just, there's Jordy. Monday through Friday from seven to nine. Yeah, you see the notification. We about to go live. We got all your favorite guests. We got them in line. It's the Jordy Collider Show. And Come have a good time. Clearing up, answering the question. I thought, my God, if she gets offered this job, she's gonna take it. It's just a crazy, fun time at LSU right now. Isn't this what everybody loves? From the boot to the east to the west coast. No matter where we go, we got the show. Open up the phone lines. Come and join the show. Make sure you tell your friends about Jordy Collider Show. Yeah. Let's go. Big day. Nice. Okay. Right. It's the Jordan Collider Show. Come have a good time. Coach, it's great to Welcome in to a Monday edition of the Jordy Colada Show live here from Click Here Digital. As always, built by RMB Builders and brought to you, our phone line is, by Southern Regional Medical Center. We're going to catch up with Doug Thompson tomorrow. There is a ton to get to this morning. So glad that we have a uh, an open guest line. No guest book today as we will have a ton to react to and tons to get to here uh, as we'll be here until 9 a.m. this morning. Uh, LSU over the weekend. LSU baseball takes the Astros classic uh, over the weekend. LSU women's basketball beats up on Kentucky yesterday on senior day. Great environment when Shaquille O'Neal came out with Angel Reese to the chance of one more year with Haley Van Lith and Reese being recognized on senior day. We'll talk about that. Matt McMahon and LSU blow out Vanderbilt on Saturday in Memorial Gymnasium. Uh, a couple of LSU football recruits putting on a show at a track meet cool. over the weekend. Who mm. knew Jelani Watkins could run like that? Did anybody know he could run like that? I mean, he made Caden Durham look slow. Made fast Caden. people look not <laughs> fast. Dog. No, I mean, you know, he cares about that time. <laughs> yeah, right. But that was that man was shot out of I don't a run cannon. No 10-8. <laughs> everybody was neck and neck, and then you see Jelani just like, all right, Whew. I got another gear that nobody else here has. You're like, oh, he's coming to campus. Keep running. Keep going. Straight to Baton Rouge. Uh, speaking of speed, the story over the weekend is that John Ross's record goes down. Xavier Worthy, the standout fast wide receiver for the University of Texas. Runs a 4-2 over the weekend, uh, beating uh, Ross by a tenth of a second. What do you run a 4-2-3? 4-2-1. 4-2-1. This was what Worthy ran. Uh, right. John Ross, Ross ran a 4-2-2. Mm-hmm. Right, beating by a tenth of a second. Yep. Um, so that goes down, but kind of lost in the shuffle there is that Brian Thomas put on a show Saturday at the Combine and made a ton of money. As he made 4-3 look like he was just kind of skipping in the park. And he kind of slipped on the uh, like did. on the start. He kind of stumbled he a little bit. He bobbled out the gate. 
You kind of wanted to see him open it up and go 100. Yeah. Like, I wanted to see 60 meters or, yeah, 60 yard <laughs> dash from, because he just got going. Right. It was unbelievable. That's, that football, that, that speed translates. Yes. Uh, Especially that body. He, uh, that, that was and they were, very impressive. And they were tracking, like, the, the speed of them doing, like, different drills, and he had the highest speed on the fade route. He ran 22 9 1. Mm. So. Mm. I mean, I saw some mocks that they waste. still have a Duze. Oh, Duze, what, is going the first yeah. uh, receiver taken? No, over no, 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 no. Going ahead of Thomas? Is well, Thomas the fourth? Yeah, the the top three consensus is Malik, Marvin Harrison, and Odunze. And Brian Thomas is like the fourth or fifth, depending on who you talk to. I mean, but I would have this. I mean, three. That was, he made him. I would <laughs> he looks like number three to me. The most yes. nervous team after that combine is has to be the Bengals. Like, we thought we were going to snag him, and nobody was going to notice right. us getting Brian Thomas. <laughs> they're never so going to know. Every, they're not going to know. Now they're like, oh, he's going to be gone. Uh, so a lot to get to, and want to make sure and start off um, by recognizing uh, today, uh, with a lot of local sports to get to, uh, recognizing a national story before we get going uh, as longtime ESPN NFL journalist Chris Mortensen passed away at the age of 72 uh, over the weekend. And the outpouring of support and the outpouring uh, of care has been uh, really cool to see from uh, everybody around the sports and ESPN community uh, that uh, watched Mort. I know growing up for, for me and watching ESPN, I mean, ESPN was such a backdrop of, of, you know, my generation's youth, which is when kind of like SportsCenter <clears throat> exploded and ESPN's coverage of the NFL exploded. And Mortensen, Chris Mortensen, uh, the Mort Report, I mean, turned into, I mean, his voice was just, it, it was so synonymous with the station, with ESPN. I mean, his voice tied to the NFL became, um, it was it was as, you know, I mean, it, it was just what it was. That That's how the NFL was reported. That was the voice of the NFL. And, you know, I was reading, I believe I was reading a book around, about ESPN, which uh, some executive from ESPN was quoted as saying, you know, if ESPN had a Mount Rushmore, that Chris Mortensen would be on it. And, um, you know, it was obviously tough to see his diagnosis come to light in 2015 of throat cancer and the way he battled it and the way he continued to work and the way that, you know, everybody supported him. I still remember Larry Fitzgerald in that playoff game when he catches a game-winning touchdown and, I mean, just like sprints to the cameras and like, you know, it was like talks about it and says, you know, we're thinking about you more. Like, I mean, like it showed just how much, you know, he, he people cared about him and how much he crossed over. And, you know, obviously Peyton Manning and uh, like saving the news so Mort could break it during. I mean, it was just it, it was stuff that uh, was different for NFL reporters during during our time and uh, a true titan of, of broadcasting. And everywhere you look, you hear how good of a dude he was, how good of a man he was, how stand-up of a, of a guy he was. Uh, and, you know, he was in Tiger Stadium a couple of times because his son played for Arkansas. And he, when, when, when those Arkansas teams came here uh, during that run, he, he was in Tiger Stadium. And um, I can remember some of the people just talking about having a chance to meet him and just how nice of a guy he was and how cool – it was just to you know, have a chance to run across him. So um, before we get to all of what happened this weekend uh, around LSU, and there's a ton to talk about, wanted to make sure and, and recognize Chris Mortensen and pay respects to uh, the longtime ESPN NFL journalist. He's also a guy that um, you know, he started in Atlanta at, um, at that newspaper at the uh, – Atlanta Journal Constitution covering the Braves and the Falcons. And, you know, he would always be down here, obviously, with the Falcons playing the Saints. 
and you know some of the local beat guys i was reading on on, on social media where sheldon mickles talked about meeting more during that time when they were both local reporters for the papers at the time with uh, Mickles covering the Saints for for the Advocate and Mortensen covering the Falcons and you know even at that time being in a smaller market Mortensen always really you know paying his respect so always just the stories around Mort were always stand up and man just wanted to make sure and you know give our respects to uh, a titan a legend uh, somebody in our industry that uh, really has paved the way for uh, you know a certain type of journalism I mean he really kind of you know, kind of pave the streets for, for people to follow. You know, people like Adam Schefter, uh, people uh, like Jay Glazer, uh, you know, those Daniel Jeremiah. I don't know if anybody saw Daniel Jeremiah's tribute yesterday during the NFL Combine uh, with, with, with Rich Eisen on the NFL Network, but Eisen announces Mortensen's, and, and if you can find this, Stewie, um, it is, it, 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 it had me, I mean, I was crying like a baby watching Daniel Jeremiah. I mean, I'm, I got to watch myself right now. Cause I, I mean, I could get teared up thinking about it, but Jeremiah, uh, I didn't know that Jeremiah and Mortensen were that close. And I mean, it's, it, it's heavy, man. It, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's as respectful and as genuine and as moving uh, of a tribute in real time. I mean, like Rich Eisen announces like in real time. I mean, he's like, it is with my greatest deep regrets that I, you know, I announced that Chris Mortensen has passed away. And um, it's, whew, it's, it's heavy. Um, so rest in peace. Chris Mortensen uh, passed away at 72 years old. Uh, over the weekend, uh, no way to transition out of that. Um, so, uh, do you want me to play the? No, don't play it. Don't play it. <laughs> He's already said no. Nope, never mind. <laughs> don't play it. Don't play that. Dusty in here. Uh, see the grown man put, cry. Just put the. Uh, but you can put the the link to it. Okay. You can find it. So if you can do that, but uh, no, don't play it. But it's it's incredible. Daniel Jeremiah, incredible tribute. All right. So where do we start here? Um, uh, after an incredible weekend for LSU athletics, I didn't mention softball. Uh, I, I imagine. Uh, I'm, yeah. I apologize, Beth Arena. And even in a weekend where I don't know if you saw this, UL mm-hmm. broke Oklahoma's mm-hmm. win streak over the weekend. It was like four years. Was, 71, was 71 games. games. Unbelievable. 71 games. Jeez. Um, Caitlin I, Clark. UL I, just. I'm not, I, are we recognizing this? The flop. For real? So. I mean, I guess we can start there. Caitlin Clark yesterday uh, versus Ohio State. Breaks the all-time scoring record uh, previously held by, I, I'm not even saying that, held by Pete Maravich um, with the all-time points scored in college basketball. And I'm not taking anything away from Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark's going to be the overall number one pick in the WNBA. She's one of, if not the best college women's basketball player of all time. From her accomplishments to what the attention to this golden age of women's basketball over the last five years. I mean, over the last five years, the sport has experienced a unrivaled popularity in just the attention, just to people paying attention to it. Look at last year's national championship games ratings to give you a, a you know, a kind of a mile marker of that and the buildup of it. Caitlin Clark ha- has been a part of the ride for the entire, the entire run and deserves a ton of credit for it. And will be recognized, in my opinion, as one of the all-time greats in the sport. But as far as the scoring leader goes in this record that, you know, Pistol Pete holds, if we're going to make it something that is breakable, we have to further explain what it is that they're going after. Right? Like, Caitlin Clark has caught and now broken this record on the heel on on the majority of her points coming behind the three point line which she is taking it full advantage of today's game and and really maximized her potential of being a scorer in basketball 
So good on her, and she needs to be recognized for that. But the way that the record was set needs to be thoroughly explained, or not even thoroughly, because it doesn't take a, a real descriptive, you know, a real, uh, you know, graphic description to tell you what Pete Maravich did. He broke the all. He, he scored the over three thousand points in three years without the three point line, averaging forty game, forty points a game. I mean, in in my opinion, the record should should sit on a shelf by itself with a huge asterisk around it that says, if you get this record, you have to do it in a certain time period or you have to do it in a certain amount of games or you have to do it in a certain amount of time that equates to how this thing was set. Because this scoring record set by Maravich was done under different times, different rules, different regulations of the game. And again, I am not discrediting what Caitlin Clark has achieved in women's college basketball. I just do not equate it to what Pistol Pete did during his time in college basketball. Bill Walton, um, whenever Pistol Pete's book came out, came out and said that they charted all of Pistol Pete's um, shots and they went through the shot chart where it listed the feet and they went back and averaged out all the shots that would have been behind the three-point line and <laughs> it's almost unbelievable whenever you look at he it says Pete Maravich would have averaged 13 three-point makes per game and would have given him a career average of 57 points a game in today's rules so I think you can take of that what you will whenever you think of averaging almost 60 points a game you can extrapolate that over three seasons and you didn't have I don't know what Caitlin Clark did her freshman year, but Pistol Pete literally wasn't allowed to play his freshman year. Right. And so I think it should be kind of on this over here, and I understand the Caitlin yeah, Clark mania. Yeah, not taking anything away No, that. no, not at all. But I think it should lead to a conversation where this should probably, like this information and this data should come back up again whenever. It's a very easy like pivot point to make. I know you want to give Caitlin her flowers, but you should also go, well, Pistol Pete did have the three-point line. It would have been 60 a game. Just never forget how it was set. Yeah. All you right. have to do when they put the graphic up is when they show Pistol Pete, you put an asterisk and below it says, did not have three-point line played, played in three, three years. years. Or freshman year. Yeah. Right. Or, yeah. Like that's all played that's, three years. It's cause it doesn't Ineligible take away from, freshman year. Right. It doesn't take away from her. It's just. Yeah. What a bizarre set of. Teaching like, history. Yeah. Exactly. Because remember, we faced this last year when what the Antoine Davis kid. Came close and oh, he had the COVID the year, the extra oh, year. Gosh. He had the extra year, and then he ended up missing it by two points. Yes, and then they wanted to play one more game that right. didn't They're count. Po- yeah, they really went. They made a run for it, but I, I think you just have to go. I mean, the game wasn't the same. Literally, it's, you right. didn't have one of the most. I would think now the most important shot in basketball, and he was oh, na- making him at a, making him thirteen times a game. Obviously, he shot a lot, but. Right. Stab was the coach, and I'm the best player here. But, but he was making I mean, it. What was the other <laughs> plan? <laughs> Pete. Well, it, there was a, there was a page that was showing how many shots he made and attempted versus she made and she attempted, and all of this is just showing she shoots more three pointers. Yeah, like it's it, the point. The shot is worth another point. Again, I mean, like <laughs> it's just it's just the facts. Right. I mean, it's not. And, and and you know, I mean, the debate probably rages a little bit more down here. In, in Baton Rouge and around LSU, and and that's fine. I mean, I, I get it that we're you know we're in the forest here. All right, because um, if you're Iowa, you go. I mean, why does it even matter? It was so sure. far. It was right. so far long ago that they right. didn't even have a three point line. I could see both sides of it, but Caitlin Clark, uh, flopper, all uh, time huge. flopper, huge. I mean, she throws a punch. Well, it, huge look at me. Did y'all see your boy from Duke? He played, he played a couple oh, days. Oh, it's a miracle. The windmill. <laughs> it's at the windmill. So let's go. I Off mean, one like, foot. So, somebody said he came back faster than DeMar Hamlin. Yeah. <laughs> With the worst injury. Right. <laughs> His <laughs> life almost, is on the line. Almost died last week. He's right. windmilling this week. Uh, it open went, court sprinting. It went from <laughs> an ankle injury to a D injury to be sore. To now he's playing. It's so it was. I mean, it, if that's not Duke basketball. <laughs> now he's getting com, a run out doing yeah. win there. <laughs> Did they lose? Did they still win? Or did they? No, they, they won. won. They won. Yeah, they won. But that is unbelievable. Flipikowski, Flopikowski, <laughs> is back in the news again. 
but I mean that's just Duke.com. Yes, it like is. Jay Billis. Like, <laughs> oh what, my goodness! I mean, Wait, talk about your <laughs> peak pro. Have y'all seen the video of the landmark people practicing for course storming? <laughs> <laughs> uh uh-uh. uh Yes. <laughs> the sister Jean, I saw she would. <laughs> she Jeez. got on the court. <laughs> Jay Billis is furious. Uh, remember our friends over at Range Fit. Start your day every day with a Range Fit uh, hydration, great hydration. Uh, no sugar, sugar free. Uh, the five essentials, electrolytes that you need to start your day. RangeFit.com. Pick it up there. Uh, mention your show on the uh, on the pickup, and you'll save yourself at checkout. Uh, RangeFit.com online and on social media as well. All right, LSU baseball over the weekend uh, in uh, in Houston takes care of business with three. Solid wins for the Tigers and Jay Johnson as the crew uh, over in Texas beat uh, the University of Texas on Friday. Uh, they take care of business versus the Raging Cajuns on Saturday, uh, and then they take down Texas State uh, on Sunday. And a weekend that featured uh, a lot of impressive outings, a lot of impressive showings uh, for individuals. I will start the conversation with Friday and Luke Holman uh, dominating, dominating uh, Texas in a very impressive piece of work. Holman, watching him work, is like, it is surgical. I mean, he's got a little bit of, I mean, Stewie and I were talking about it. He doesn't have that, like, I'm going to kill you, like, intensity that Skeens has. Like, like, stare at me, please. He almost has like this, like serial killer. Yeah, it's, it's very, like, it's, it's like just very like a quiet. Dexter. Yeah, you know I mean, mean it's like, surgical. Just very, just methodical and give, yes. like he works quickly. But it's not like Skeeds was waiting for you to even look at him for him Absolutely. to get pissed off. It was right. very much like I'm six seven, two hundred and fifty pounds. Please get me going. Like he was the guy at the bar that was like, oh, if you brush into me, it might like it might go down. <laughs> and Holman's just over the quiet in the corner, like Dahmer. Like, oh, I'm just going to wait this thing out for the end, until the end of the night. Just dealing. Dealing under the table. It was, it's two different, it, there's like, what's the saying? It's multiple ways to skin a cat. Yeah. This is Holman being dominant at a total, in a totally different way, but being almost as effective for what LSU needs him to do. Right. Like, he can throw any pitch for a strike at any point in time to where you're so off balance as a hitter that you're, you're up there guessing and no guess is a good guess. And you could hear the way that Jay talked about him after. He's like, look, I know it's not Skeens, and though he did it a different way, but this is what you look at in terms of pitchability yeah. Yeah, is right. what he called it. Is That is as dominant as a, of a college pitcher as you are going to get in, in this form of baseball because everything's on the table at all times. And that Texas game, I think, is the blueprint for what LSU wants to do going forward. When you look at the offense, to get LeBaron Johnson out the game as quickly as they did, they got him up to 90 pitches. Man, they worked him. They, I mean, he struck him. They were working. He was, he was getting, he was yeah. getting out. So it was he just was. Like, He's every, electric. Every, every at bat, bat was, was seven, five, eight. six. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he went three innings, and he had 91 pitches. Oh. And then, and, but... You go on the flip side, and if you watch it, like you watch the first inning, he struck out the side, but it took thirty-five pitches for him to do it. And I would, I would imagine the dugout like, "Hey, that's a that's a great at bat, like right. from all of you, like great, yeah. great half an inning for us because like that thing we're whittling away at this guy because he is dominant. Like that split finger he throws is just a, it's a zero yeah. gravity ball. It disappears. Uh, he's a he's a pro. Yeah, and he, he's electric with the fastball. But the way LSU attacked that particular day on that Friday, where you move Holman into the starting role. Then you go with and just have competitive at bat, competitive at bat against LeBaron Johnson. You saw what happened whenever Texas had to go to the bullpen that early. LSU's built for that. If they have to go to the pin early, they've got arms to be able to do it. I don't think Texas says they saw the depth of LSU. Yeah. And that was probably the most complete game that LSU could have played. That put them on. If you weren't thinking about LSU as being able to repeat, I think a whole lot of heads turned no, after Friday. I, I, man, watching that game, I was thinking like I, I, I didn't, I didn't know they were this good. Right, and I, I think, I think that's part of why they made the move for Holman. They're like, all right, and Doug talked about it, and I, I agreed with him. It's like Jay wouldn't make a move to just to do it against Texas, but I think the way that the stars aligned, it just made sense to be able right. to move Holman up right now. And then when you saw him deal like that, you're like, okay, ho. Oh. Yeah, because Holman's mean, been doing it quietly on Saturday. He has. I mean, he came into the game with 18 strikeouts. And very impressive two weeks of work. And then on Friday, records a career-high 12 strikeouts, five and two-thirds, allowed just three hits. And those hits were like, 
I mean, little like oh yeah, de- bleeders. Like I mean, they just got Texas, lucky. Texas yeah, leaguers. Just got lucky. I mean, it was it, it, it was it was tough. I mean, he allowed three hits, threw ninety one pitches, uh, threw ninety one pitches, sixty one of them for strikes. Uh, and, and as Lloyd said, Jay Johnson said after the game, Luke is as good of a pitcher as I have ever coached in terms of executing pitches as far as just pitch-to-pitch execution. I don't know how you plan for him because he can beat you in a lot of different ways. The skill and the aptitude and the execution are on another level right now. And then LSU offensively on Friday night uh, versus, uh, versus Texas was able to uh, – uh, to run out 6-3 uh, on the uh, scoreboard. And Jared Jones was the story on Friday at the plate. Three for four uh, with Jones uh, with just a massive opposite field home run <laughs> in which he celebrated with a horns down stomp on home plate. The most aggressive I've ever, <laughs> ever, seen. ever, like, ever seen. Wow. <laughs> I mean, like, I didn't know that's he, another thing that I have to, like, just be, so like, completely heart. honest about what I absolutely just love about this baseball team is it makes you feel like like some old school LSU baseball. Right. Like, I mean, it has been, if you have been watching LSU baseball since the skip days, some of his teams in the 90s felt like football teams. I mean, like, they would get off the bus talking trash in the games, I mean, like you know, I mean, like they, you know, a couple of they them know they're good. get thrown out, you know. And I, I, I'm not encouraging that by any means, but I mean, <laughs> it was just, it was a different type of feel to it. And these teams have kind of just that juice to it, where you're like, even if you get into a game where there may be teams like I, people tell me Arkansas and Florida. They might be as or a little bit more talented. They don't have that part. No. Right? right? Like, that's the part, like, that'll get you, that, that'll beat you in the, the postseason. It's championship mentality. Yeah. Right. They've like all been that. there. Every, exactly. Every guy that you see that from, like, whether it be Travinsky Gavin or Gidry. Gidry. Gidry, I mean. Gavin I mean. Gidry. Is he going to fight somebody? <laughs> I hope. I mean, like, it's like. <laughs> well, you got to go through <laughs> Bayer and, and he, Travinsky. He's another right. one. Like, if you make eye contact with him, he's going to charge you. Oh, you yeah. saw you saw it yesterday. <laughs> like, Texas State didn't over. deserve any of that. <laughs> and he was just, like, in the middle of the afternoon, just like, oh, yeah, there's the fucking hammer again. You're like, Jesus, it's Sunday, right. and you're playing Texas State. He's like, I don't care. Um, it was, uh, like, his mentality getting out there is, it's not manufactured either. You would think that he's kind of doing it like, oh, I got to get myself right. juiced up to be right. a closer. No. I and think none it, of it is. There, he is shot. Shav- yeah, he's shot best for Friday Night Lights. Like, Jesus Christ, son, calm down. <laughs> That's like, what the endearing <laughs> part, I think, is about this team is that none of it's contrived. Like, right. none no. of it looks fake. Like, it's all real. Because then, you know, you get to Saturday, and you're thinking, like, well, I mean, like, people were like, well, is he going to throw a jump? And you're like, yeah, I guess. I mean, like, and, you know, I told everybody. I'm like, Doug said that they're going to throw him on your Friday night. Yeah, 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 like, I was I running with I mean, that I've told everybody. <laughs> you know, like, what do you think about the baseball? I'm like, Doug Thompson thinks they're going to throw Doug and Gage Jump. <laughs> Little Bernie you know, like, said to watch out for Jump. And then Jump. I mean, for as impressive as Holman was on Friday, and by far, impre- I mean, like, Holman was the most impressive pitcher that LSU threw all weekend. And LSU threw some cats this weekend. I mean, Gage Jump. They really legitimately have three Friday night guys. Yep. And that's another reason why I'm like, you take this team anywhere. Anywhere. You take them anywhere. Because the offense does not concern me at all. Like, Jay Johnson is, to me, what Lane Kiffin is to offense in in football. Like, if you hire him, you will have an offense. You know, like, it's like if you get Kirby Smart, like, I'm, the defense is good. Like, we're, we're secure. Like, if you get Jay Johnson in baseball, your offense is going to be okay. And, I mean, it, it's, it was March. It was the first weekend of March. Like, I, as they progress, I'm not – the offense, if they have these arms, if they have these options, and then they have these frontline guys like Jump – and Holman and and I thought Hurd was Thatcher Hurd. I mean, he pitches the way they, there's so much potential in Thatcher Hurd that I think that's why people are always going to compare right. him to what he's done when he looks perfect, when he looks as good as he can. That's always out there. But when you even when he pitches, quote unquote, not up to his standard, 
and still giving you five and a third yeah, with right. eight strikeouts. I mean, and like, like, sorry about it. I mean, I, I haven't watched a lot of SEC baseball, but if you watch the SEC network and they do a great job on the on the recap shows where, I mean, they kind of dive into some of these baseball highlights early season. Obviously, they're filling time, but it gives you, if you're watching, you kind of get a good idea. I guarantee you, if you're watching LSU's highlights, people around the conference are like, damn, they're good again, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, I look around and I'm like, yeah, they got some teams out there that can hit. Like, I was watching Florida the other day was playing Miami, and Florida can mash. Well, they got, oh like, boy. Yeah, Caglione's a stud. A stud. I mean, like he's, and, and they got guys around him, too. It's not just him. I mean, they got some cats. But I was watching their, their pitcher, and, like, Florida's usually the standard, right? And I'm sure they got their guys. And I don't know who I was watching, and I don't know what the ro- part of the rotation <laughs> it was. But I know if you flipped on LSU this weekend, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, you thought, they had, they're winning again. Damn. Yeah. I mean, that's a frontline guy that looks like he could start on Friday for anybody. I don't think LSU de- never didn't have the lead this weekend. We go back to Rice. Every yeah, they, I can't were, think they, that were, they, they never relinquished the and lead. And the most impressive part that I thought about them was when they got pushed, when they got pressed a little bit, like when Texas made a little bit of a run. UL, UL yeah. put some pressure on them L. on fr- on Saturday. You know, and I kind of even thought like Texas State, you know, like they put the gas down a little bit. Like you had to, you kind of had to tighten the belt. Oh, absolutely. That's what. Well, that's and that's and, the part you forget never about. Really, they no. never really wavered. The they only, never shook at it. The only thing that, like, you would if you want to call it wavering, was bringing in Fidel or Gavin Gidry. It's like okay, we we kind of played with our food a little bit. We wanted to get some guys some innings. Lower was probably the one that went. Probably one guy too long, but he wanted to finish it out. You saw Jay trust him to finish it out. That was his first career save for LSU, and it meant a lot to him. That game meant a lot to LSU. Because like, you could see it on the other side where ULL was trying to make a run because they wanted it. Yeah, bad. Uh, it was a World Series. Yeah, they, they, were, they, they threw their ace, yeah. and LSU threw their, de facto, I guess, their second ace and jumped. It was a good game, though. It like, was. It was. Wanna, I mean, UL, that was, that was impressive. The biggest I mean, win of the weekend goes to the softball team, though. Yeah. And then you saw, I mean— Texas just went, they they just went fell apart. They fell apart. Yeah, they uh, LSU killed enough. them, and then they well then they go up what eleven to three against Vanderbilt and they blow that lead oh, where wow. it was the next day <laughs> yeah. where it was oh no like I love it <laughs> yeah no and they were on Twitter and it's eleven to three I and saw they're that. all fired up no. <laughs> and then you know an hour later it's twelve eleven and they're just. Some frozen. some Texas account was like yeah SEC tell me again how bad I'd be good for them yeah no no. I mean, SEC baseball might not They want be. it so badly to be like, yeah. oh, they, they don't know that we're coming. And it's like Texas but I, is two years know, like in they, a row, they, three they years in a row. They do concern me right. in basketball and football. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, I mean, we're a baseball school. Right. But baseball 100%. is going to be an issue. They don't, yeah. they don't want to talk trash in baseball. No, but they, then the horns down just goes everywhere. It does. I mean, you had Paxton Kling do it in the outfield. You well, had Bear Jones. You call it out. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Don't bring attention to it. People love to do it. Don't talk about how immature and how much you hate it. Right. It's just it's just going to make it worse. I and mean, it makes everybody want to do it. And it makes Jared it. Jones put it in the dirt. <laughs> I mean, and when you saw the umpire, what is he going to do? <laughs> right. Like, he right. just watched I mean, it happen. It was like that referee looking at Clyde. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, Clyde catches the game where he's like. <laughs> oh. Bear Jones was making no bones about it. Clyde was a sneaky Bear Jones did it in front of every and God and his mother, and it was like okay. And then you see Texas State, the umpire. Obviously, it was a point of like a point of contention for the way that LSU was quote unquote celebrating after um, what? Oh, Neal's no, what is it? Um, it was the Pearson. Left, Pearson's home run. Brady Neal came too far out to give a high five, and that's when Jay Johnson lost his mind. Yeah. He ran out there and was like, what are we doing here? Like, he's, he's next up in the lineup. Like, he's supposed <laughs> to be on deck. And he's like, well, I'm just, I, was, I was told to Can't watch y'all. Hands. And it was like, he got all up into LSU's, like, their little, you know, they, they're bringing back, like, the 09, like, kind of get through the crowd a little bit, a little football mentality. And he was like, their umpire was, like, in the way. He's like, what are we doing? Yeah. Like, and then you, you're having people getting kicked out. Somebody took the bat too far down the line and flipped it, and he got ejected before you could even round the bases. It's like, well, does it count? Not like, for LSU. Huh? No, not for LSU. Yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. saying around the yeah, country yeah, 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 where yeah. they're trying to police the sport that it's fueled by adrenaline and emotion. Like, right. you're going to take out Gavin Guidry? Like, <laughs> right. are you going to eject him for cursing? <laughs> right. He curses at the batter up. Uh, that, yeah. Ball. That's a warning. <laughs> like, to charge the umpire. Oh, my God. But that's what... Like, I'm sure some people will look at LSU and the playing that the way that they are where it's going to be, oh, 
who do they think they are type deal, but I think it's the opposite where I don't think you put any respect on LSU's name after coming off a national championship. Oh, it was Skeens, it was Cruz. This team is saying, what? okay, yeah, like yeah. y'all are going to keep thinking y'all can beat us? Like we're going in with a chip on our shoulder, which is the most dangerous way to play when you're already talented. Okay, and did anybody see the kid from UL, like tear his ACL? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, and then just <laughs> – he, he just got up and yeah, was like, I'm off. good. But that was – Another play of Gay's jump, just like yeah. confusing yeah. people. <laughs> well, my favorite thing about jump is he doesn't give them a second right. between pitches. I mean, like he pitches like, and like I, it, like all the of clock LSU is in one right. second. <laughs> like I mean, really and truly, well, LSU might at, at like the midseason mark, SEC time, they could have four guys with Kate Anderson. I mean, like after watching him, he's another one that like works deals. And it would be. I don't he's wanna, he's high level. I don't want to say it would be a waste to throw him in the midweek, but it would be almost oh. a waste. Oh, I, of I an think arm. It, I think it would be. Yeah. But then For you as think talented about talented as they are at pitcher. Yeah, I think it would be a waste. Yeah, you could find somebody, and it's no slight. Like you want to win your midweek games, but I think you yeah. see Kate Anderson in a role where yeah. if that's a hurt's going to pitch like this, where it's five and a third, you come in with give you Kate Anderson right mean, after like, you, like you to close out on a Sunday. Like you saw it last year where. It was Nate, Atkins, Nate Atkinhausen and Riley Cooper to go, like, kind of double-barrel starters. All right, you give me four, I'll give you four, and then we'll try to close it down some, well, some way, somehow. That is not the problem with LSU this year. They have an, a, a bevy of arms that are going to make you just, it's hell. Yeah. If you're on the offensive side. Oh, like, man, it's a wave. The, the, the thing in baseball of, of any, at any level is get the starter out. For mm-hmm. LSU, it's, oh, God, like, who's this coming? I mean, Christian Little came in for, what, Two appearances, and he's coming in throwing 96, and you don't even see him. Like That's the type of thing that you're dealing with with LSU where everybody can absolutely deal for the freshman, for Kate Anderson. It's going to be, I don't know how you don't play him at some point. Like oh, He's going to be yeah, the next. No, if, if anybody has a spotty start, I think he's going to be the first guy out to pin, whether it be Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. I agree. And that's a great way to use him. And you forget also you have Jaden Newt over there that wants to come back and Chase Shores that can also come back. They're going to have a problem not they're going to have a problem cutting people off right. this team for SEC play. Like who's not going to travel? I mean, I was thinking about that. Like how do you how do you make that roster? I mean, it's it's a great problem, but it's got to it, it has to be stressing. You can see he's stressing. He's trying to get people in. Like right. I mean, like he brings up certain guys every press conference. Yeah, stay with me. Yeah, you, yeah. you know, like, like like I mean, I think he has got I mean, this could just be me be like home or whatever, but I think he's got such a good pulse on the team and has them bought in on such a clip of... I Look at the catching situation with Brady Neal, Milazzo, and Travinsky. Like, he got both those guys to come back, and that wasn't even guaranteed to play. Mm-hmm. Like, Brady Neal was coming back, and he's probably your best bat at the catcher position because you could put Travinsky at DH. But Milazzo to come back and still be able to play, like, he's not going to hit at the same clip as Brady Neal, but he still wanted to come back just to play for the team. Right. And so it's... You can see the buy-in for everybody in their role and what they're going to do, and it's it's a testament to what Jay's built here, and for people that just want to be a part of it. Like, where else would I go? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it, it 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 feels it feels like a you know like a tidal wave is behind it when you feel and look at LSU baseball. Just the players, the guys, the guys on the bench are more impressive than the guys on the field. That's that's what's most impressive about it is that. Every single day, it feels like it's a new name, new face, new guy, and the new faces are are solid. I mean, you know, like Milam. I mean, Fidel. You know, I mean, to be able to hold an everyday spot as a true freshman on this team is a hell of an accomplishment. I would even say hold to be able to make yourself the starter in a lineup where you weren't. Like for right. the way that Milam came in and busted the door down, be like, "I'm going to be too good to ignore as a freshman." It is super impressive because you had Pearson come in. And he was going to play second. That was the original lineup. And now with Milam, it becomes, oh, this is way better. Yeah. Like the way that the – like just to say what it is, Pearson's a better outfielder than infielder. And Milam is such a good second baseman that it makes – they turned two double plays yesterday. Like if you go back to 09, whenever they didn't have a double play almost all the way through SEC ball. Like right before SEC ball, they didn't have a double play turn. Then they make the switch. I think they turned three double plays the first weekend that they you know brought in a freshman to come play shortstop. Yeah. What they've done in the infield with Milam, who's not only five tool defensively, but what he does on the offensive end, like that's a whole lot to get from a freshman. I know it's early. You'll see it probably taper down a little bit when you get to like SEC baseball. 
But for what he's done to be able to kick the door down and just become your everyday second baseman, super impressive. Incredible swagger, too, on the kid. Oh, my, I mean, he looks like he's been there for three years. <laughs> I mean, like, unreal. Looks like a big leaguer. He, uh, he plays like one. Like, everything is just so easy for him. Uh, shout out to our guy, Caleb Heine, over at Landscape 180. If you're looking to update your landscaping, now is the time to start planning. Landscape 180 offers free consultations that can put a plan together for any budget. They offer uh, irrigation install, drainage solutions, outdoor lighting, and so much more. Also, now's a great time to get landscaping cleaned up uh, from the freeze. If you're looking for a full makeover or just a cleanup, uh, you can find Landscape One L- at 180, and they can help you today. Online, landscape180.com, or get in touch with Caleb, the director, uh, directly, uh, the owner, 225-421-6933. Uh, Caleb Heine does great work over at Landscape 180. They can help you, whether it's residential or commercial. Uh, they do some pretty big jobs uh, over at Landscape 180. Uh, if you can find them uh, online, uh, you can find them there at landscape180.com. Uh, all right, so from baseball uh, across the street uh, to uh, to softball, Coach Beth Tarina and the ladies uh, stay undefeated on the season as the pitching staff finished yesterday uh, with under a run ERA, 15 strikeouts in 14 innings, allowing just one run and one walk as the LSU Lady Tigers are the lone undefeated team in the country as they defeated McNeese uh, to 2-1 uh, to one for the second consecutive day and then shut out Lo- uh, Louisiana Tech uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the eighth shutout of the season, 2-0. Uh, pitchers uh, Sidney Burson and Kelly Lynch each threw a complete game. Lynch posted her second shutout of the season against Louisiana Tech. Uh, Taylor Pleasance uh, and Gutierrez, the first baseman, led LSU with three hits on six at-bats. Both turned RBI. So uh, LSU softball, uh, incredibly impressive with Coach Tarina uh, as they yesterday beat McNeese and Louisiana Tech. They improved to 19-0 on the season. As up next, they open up SEC play with a three-game series. They'll be at Kentucky uh, starting on Friday, March 8th, uh, through the weekend. So they'll be in Lexington this weekend uh, as the ladies take care of business over the weekend versus McNeese and Louisiana Tech going into conference uh, as the only undefeated team in the country. Uh, And then down the road in Lafayette, uh, the Lady Cajuns went up to Norman, Oklahoma and uh, halted a 71-win streak uh, for Oklahoma softball, uh, reigning national champs. Uh, really the standard in the sport uh, when you talk about it. I mean, if LSU uh, is the standard in baseball, uh, much like Alabama has been in football, um, Oklahoma is that in in softball. And for UL and the Lady Cajuns to roll into Norman yesterday uh, and end that winning streak is an incredible accomplishment. So congratulations to them uh, as well. Uh, Speaking of the uh, the ladies, uh, yesterday in the Maribyrn Center was a pretty special atmosphere as uh, it was senior day and coach Kim Mulkey was recognizing her crew including Haley Van Lith and Angel Reese who were both tight-lipped after the uh, press conference uh, we're not saying much uh, to uh, what the status of what they were going to uh, what their plans were going to be next whether they were going to come back or whether they were going to stay uh, and they were asked about it uh, after the game, nobody was saying anything. The crowd was chanting, uh, one more year, Adam. Uh, Angel Reese brought Shaq out, uh, which is an excellent play. Uh, kind of behind the scenes on that, Shaq's shooting the documentary uh, with Amazon. Uh, his company is shooting the, uh, the, the, okay. the documentary with um, Angel Reese, Jaden Daniels, and uh, Livy Dunn uh, for, for uh, is it Amazon? Yes. Yeah, for Amazon, um, and that's why he's spending he's spending a lot of time in Baton Rouge, um, and you know I mean he's he's working on I think a he's always documentary. welcome. Yeah, for sure. Because I, mean, <laughs> I thought that might have been a little bit of maybe a peek behind the curtain of if she was staying or going. Like this is kind of a big you know right. It's a big gesture for Shaq to come out, but the fact that he's in Baton Rouge and doing this documentary probably not as big or as much of a tell as you would think. Because I mean that's a that's the biggest that's the biggest draw as LSU has. Um, 
I, I will say that I, I've, I've kind of done some digging on this over and trying to find some information out on just kind of what they are feeling and thinking on, on Van Lith uh, and Reese here. And, and I would say that if I was, if I was to – walk up to the window today and make a bet on it, I would say that they both came back. And I'm not reporting that. I don't feel like, you know, I mean, that's no, you know, nothing that, that, that I would run to the press with. But, you know, I mean, this is an opinion-based show, and we talk a lot about LSU athletics, and Angel Reese and Haley Van Lith mean a ton to the present team uh, of LSU women's basketball. And if they were to come back, that would be a, a huge effect on next year's team as well. And if, if I was to give a prediction today on whether they would come back or not, I, I, would, I would say they do. I, I would think they would. And, you know, I think LSU has done a tremendous job behind the scenes of really laying out what the advantage for them to be on campus would look like next season. And, you know, from, from an academic standpoint, they've both – pretty much taking care of all of their requirements. Van Liss, you know, she's a graduate transfer who came down. Reese is, is, is close to graduating. I mean, the academics part is, you know, I mean, they would pretty much be Mettenberger and Burrow. I mean, I think Mettenberger was taking a bowling class and Burrow was taking a, you know, a golf class. Mm. But... And really, you know, making sure the money, the NIL, all that stuff is right. And then showing them what the roster would look like with them on the team. I mean, it's a lot like what we talked about LSU baseball a couple of minutes ago. I mean, a culture and an environment that's being created is is one that, you know, I mean, the team really kind of runs it. I mean, Jay Johnson puts it together and he's the guy that, like, you know, gives you the, the, the outlines and the boundary of it. But then he's confident he's bringing in the right people that can run the locker room, run the team, want to be there. I mean, it's no accident that every off weekend, Paul Skeens and Dylan Cruz had, they were back in Baton Rouge. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's as, as good for recruiting as anything. Oh, and they, they've talked about that. Like Malazzo was talking about whenever he came to LSU and – what he continues to do at LSU, he's like, I was here whenever, you know, I was catching different guys in the bullpen. And he goes, I mean, you can even rewind to last year. Kevin Gosman called me to come up because he wanted somebody to come catch. He was throwing to a That's right. a kid in high school that was trying to catch Gosman, and he threw the first one, he dinked it off his head, and he was like, oh, no. <laughs> and the kid behind the plate was like, oh, no. Like, I didn't know. He's like, I was, this wasn't even me at full go. Like, I was giving him one, a feeder one. And then Milazzo showed up, and then he ended up catching five or six guys that are still in the bigs that wanted to come throw. And that's what LSU has is just people that come back. And it's, and it's talented guys that are, like I said, still in the major leagues that want to not only give back to LSU, but it just produces an environment that other people want to be around. Yeah. And women's basketball can do the same thing. I got a different vibe from, uh, from watching the presser and cutting it up. It, just, it felt very moo, like moot was the, like moot was the word, where – or mum is the word, excuse me, where it wasn't, they danced around it a lot, but it also felt like they weren't, like, smiling or, like, there's something coming next. It feels like Haley Van Lith isn't coming back. That's just my read of the situation, what I got from it, where the way she answered the questions, I don't know, that, I haven't seen a lot of her pressers, but it didn't feel like she, it was something that she was excited to talk about. Yeah. And, uh, like, Angel, Van, Angel, I mean, Angel, like, crushes every right. media opportunity. She had. It's hard, it's impossible to get a read on her. She's always happy. <laughs> so, I don't know about her, but... It felt like Van Lith maybe, as she talked a lot about like different opportunities that she's been doing with the WNBA while being in college and how like taxing that was with her time. So I don't know if I don't know I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it's the position change or what, but I don't. If anything, it would make more sense for Angel to leave and Van Lith to stay. I agree. But, I just I, feel I mean from like, a basketball standpoint. Yeah. Exactly. I feel like the decision is going to be made after after the national. If you win the national championship. I feel like the motivation for both of them to come back is very little because Angel would have just won two in a row and a national championship's the reason Haley's here. Right. So if they win, the motivation to come back and do this all over again is probably very little. But if they don't capture the national championship that they're both here for, the motivation might be a little bit higher on yeah, let's come back and play 
Let's do it again. Run with it back this, to the get same what team. we came here for. Yeah. Right. And so. I can spin it the other way, where it's if you win one, it's like, let's right. get three. Right. No doubt. Flaget's ball. And there's a part of it that I wonder if Kim Mulkey almost wants to close the book right. on this chapter and there start could a new be. one. There could be that. I mean, because, because she's the one that floated it out at the beginning. Because yeah. Flaugé, watching yesterday, because there's no Michaela Williams, who's also going to be a star. Yeah. You know, other players weren't having their best game. She that balled layup, out. That layup she hit you was know? incredible. Incredible. Like when she can Man, drive like, to the basket, she's, she's gotten so good at finishing around the rim with a floater, has. a pull up, or Euro. Like Kyrie reverse yeah. <laughs> yesterday. I mean, like, in her open court. Ball handling, right? I mean, like, has gotten so much better. At and that's been able to show off her athleticism. Mm-hmm. I mean, because she's, I, I can't think of a floor outside of South Carolina where she hadn't been the clear cut best athlete right. on the floor. I mean, like, some of the rebounds she gets. I mean, she's one hand snatch. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, it's it's pretty impressive the way that she's athletically. Just a couple of clicks ahead of everybody, and that layup yesterday was just. I mean, she shows off every game now. Right, mm-hmm. like one or two possessions, she'll just like kind of show off. Well, in the second half yesterday, the the offense for LSU and the energy kind of died, and Kentucky started. I mean, they didn't really make a run, but they started pushing back and cutting away. And Flage responded on like three straight possessions, where she just was like, "All right, I I got this." Which she scored twenty two. Was, yeah, and I think she had three or four points in the first half. So all of that was in the second half to keep LSU afloat. So there is a, like Lloyd said, there's a piece to it where it's like, I kind of want to see Michaela Williams and Flaugé and some of these younger players get the opportunity to really show off what all they can do. Right, because yeah. that would be Kim Mulkey's like recruiting class, right. you know, that she kind of handpicked to come to LSU as opposed to I mean, she couldn't be more thankful that Angel Reese and Haley Van Lith both picked LSU, but it feels like there's just a, something on the other side of the door if you're just trying to read into it as to why it's gone the way that it has. Yeah. In terms of, it's her last year. She said she's leaving. Right. And they haven't announced anything. They just did senior day. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it it's very odd. It, it is strange a little bit. I, I get what you're saying. Remember Hughes Mechanical? Online, HughesMechanical.net. You can find their headquarters in Zachary. They have an office up in the North Shore by uh, uh, Mandeville. Uh, or in Covington, uh, you can find them there. They can always find them online at HughesMechanical.net, 225-658-2147. Hughes Mechanical Contractors, they're a trusted Daikin dealer, HVAC services that you can find for commercial or residential needs. Hughes Mechanical Contractors online at HughesMechanical.net, 225-658-2147, 225-658-2147. Call Travis Hughes and the crew and ask them to take care of your HVAC needs for you. Uh, whether, like we said, commercial or uh, they are residential, you can find them as we will, uh, they will be online, HughesMechanical.net, or call them, 225-658-2147. Uh, all right, so coming up in hour two, we will talk, obviously, the NFL Combine, as Brian Thomas uh, put on an absolute show, uh, much like we thought he would. Uh, he went up there and wowed everybody with a 4-3-4 a uh, dazzling display with the 40-yard dash that he made look very easy. And then he topped out at nearly 23 miles an hour uh, at 22.9 miles an hour uh, in a couple of his route runnings. He jumped 38 and a half. I mean, it was just very impressive showing uh, for Brian Thomas. We'll talk about the effects on that uh, coming up uh, here in hour number two. We'll also uh, get back to more of some of the uh, the baseball conversation as baseball uh, coming up this week, one of the great road trips uh, for LSU baseball, an annual trip down to Hammond, America, as Southeastern plays host. The Lions will place host uh, to LSU like they usually do in a March tilt uh, as the baseball program will pull in uh, to, uh, to Hammond on Wednesday night and take on Southeastern, uh, which is usually a great uh, atmosphere, great environment. If you've ever had a chance to check that game out, uh, and be one of the lucky ones that gets a ticket and is able to get into that game. Uh, it's it's always uh, a great environment and a great atmosphere. So uh, they have Southeastern this weekend. Um, uh, excuse me, Southeastern uh, coming up uh, this week Wednesday. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, and then they have coming into uh, into town uh, this weekend. I want to say it was Creighton no, Xavier. 
uh, oh. Xavier out of Ohio uh, is coming in for a Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, for LSU baseball. So we'll talk more uh, about that in hour two. And then spring football gets going this week, uh, which is another storyline down here in Baton Rouge. So we'll talk some of the storylines uh, heading in uh, to the 15 practices. Who were some of the players we're looking most uh, to seeing out on the practice field? Uh, jump inside of the chat. If you don't mind, you'll find us here at New Orleans.football's YouTube uh, channel. Like, share, comment, uh, but leave the player uh, that you're most looking to hear about in spring drills, uh, whether it be a first time uh, player, a new face, or a veteran coming back. Uh, who are you looking forward to, to watch, get a report on, watch in the spring game? Leave the name inside the chat. Uh, we'll get some conversation out of it in an hour or two. Uh, come back with us. Jordy Collada Show is always built by RMB Builders and live here from Click Here Digital. Red Stick Sports, a local staple in Baton Rouge to all sports fans, was founded back in 1981 and has remained a family business for over 40 years. Today, they still have the great selection on the floor, but they're also a leader in custom apparel for businesses, sports teams, and other groups. Take it from us, everybody over here at FM Digital Media. They help us out with all of our apparel. Let them help you out today. Go ask for Cody over at Red Stick Sports. Check him out online at redsticksports.biz. The Jordy Collada Show is brought to you by A Bears Lawn Maintenance. Commercial or residential, A Bears Lawn Maintenance is ready to work. A Bears can tackle all your homeowners association requirements. Call Blake at 225-485-8022. A Bears Lawn Maintenance. Hey, Tiger fans, when you're traveling through Natchez, Mississippi, make sure to visit Tom and Wright Granning at Go Mart and On The Go Deli, where you can fill up your tank and your belly. Go Mart has clean restrooms, community coffee, an awesome beer cave, and a great selection of anything you may need on your trip. Located at 4 Sergeant Prentice Drive as you're entering Natchez on the left. Also stop by Wardo's Po' Boys at 309 North Broadway on the beautiful Natchez Bluff, where the Po' Boys are so good you'll swear you're in Cajun country. At Auctioner, we know healing is a team sport. That's why we've partnered with world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. James Andrews, to create the Auctioner Andrews Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute. Whether you're a professional athlete or a weekend warrior, our team of specialists are dedicated to getting you back in the game. So whatever your reasons are for reaching your personal best, we've only got one, you. Auctioner Andrews Institute, long live you. All right, buddy. Make yep. it a good shot. Oh, yeah. Sticking the roof in. Roofs up! Roofs up! Roofs up! Roofs up! Roofs up! Beautiful roof every single time. True. True. Well, the Oscars Andrews Sports Medicine Institute collaborative effort uh, was uh, an idea from Dr. Andrews and myself to bring together two great names, the Andrews name and the Oscar name, to elevate the quality of care for athletes in the state of Louisiana, where he's from. I always thought I would come back to Louisiana to practice orthopedics with my subspecialty being sports medicine. This was an opportunity through Oshners to come back and work the entire state to help develop and take sports medicine to a new level. As an orthopedic surgeon, what this means in the future in terms of you know, access for our community, the type of care that Dr. Andrews pioneered, words can't describe how valuable that is. Oshner has a great opportunity here to, to really grow, and Dr. Burnham, of course, is the mainstay of making that happen. If you want to have first-class sports medicine care, check in with Dr. Burnham and his group, and you'll be more than impressed and pleased. Fourier Insurance Agency, established in 1946, helping you with your home, auto, commercial, life and health insurance needs 
around in Baton Rouge at 4275 Government Street and online at FourierAgency.com. Whatever insurance you're in the market for, home, auto, commercial, contractors, life and health, get in touch with Fourier Insurance Agency, FourierAgency.com, or give them a call at 225-383-0682, Fourier Agency. Get Gordon. And get it done, yo. Yeah. Everybody know Gordon in a 225. And he done link with Big Four. He got Buku ties, Ferrari sliding, flying in a new cool ride. And every time I ride by, I see a brand new sign. I'm a Gordon. I know that he gon' get it done. Whether it's a big truck crash or a hit and run. Recovery funds, he fighting to get a ton. Mike Epps, man, we all about the Benjamin. Handling injuries, man, are you kidding me? Gordon McKernan, a champion energy. Yeah, family man with a family plan. Get Gordon, he gon' fix it like a handy. Get yeah. Gordon. And get it done. Welcome back. Monday edition of the Jordy Colada Show. Live weekend here. Recapping it all on the show. Make sure and like, share, subscribe if you found us here. We appreciate it. We will be here until 9 a.m. this morning. Uh, recapping the very busy weekend, as we said, as in hour number one. Uh, we talked all about LSU baseball rolling into Houston this weekend. Taking uh, all three games. In fact, taking the tournament, the Astros Foundation Classic, uh, as they defeated Texas on Friday. Defeated UL on Saturday uh, and then took care of business yesterday versus Texas State uh, to take their three games and take the championship home to Baton Rouge where they will travel down to Hammond, America on Wednesday uh, and take on uh, the uh, Southeastern Lions. Is that where Jacques had the uh, baseball incident? I think so. Because they let everybody that on is. the field. They let everybody on the field. <laughs> so what's... Yeah, so he threw the ball <laughs> over his head. We have to talk uh, to him about it when he comes yeah, back right. on Wednesday. On Jacques Wednesday, what a day! He might he might send his protege down just to avoid him in America. I mean, by the way, shout out to Eads. I think Josh Eads. John, uh, it, it might Josh. be Josh. It is John. It John. is John. It's John Eads. Jonathan John Eads. Um, great work in being like the, the the timeliness of the the post because 
I, I love the Jay Johnson post games. I mean, I, I love Jay Johnson's press conference because he tells you what he's thinking. I mean, like he does a great job, I guess, of like not giving information, but like he he says a lot. Um, and WAFB was doing a great job of being able to get the reporting on the ground and then put it on their YouTube channel. And as Jock has said uh, each week here with us, Eads is a you know a standout and uh, somebody that has made Jock's transition. Um, you know, to, to, to sports director, very easy. Uh, and you can see why, because I mean, he's, he's a grinder, man. I mean, that guy is, it's that game wasn't over for an hour and, and the post game reaction for Johnson was up every single day, uh, on the road. So, uh, as somebody who is, uh, consuming that content, uh, and it seemed like a lot of people were just by the numbers and looking at, at the people that were watching it. Um, I appreciate that very much. Uh, and I would, I would encourage you to follow WAFB's, uh, YouTube channel as well, because, uh, they're doing great uh, work as, as far as covering, uh, not only the news, but, but sports as well with, with Jacques and his crew, uh, and Eads and uh, Kevin Baptiste is another one who does incredible work over there. Uh, so shout out to the crew. Uh, we talked to LSU baseball, uh, Tigers winning that one. Uh, we also talked uh, LSU softball. LSU softball, the only undefeated team in the country, as they improved to 19 and 0 yesterday uh, with uh, with Lady Softball. They'll open up SEC play this weekend in Lexington, uh, taking on Kentucky. Uh, we also uh, talked about the uh, the sad story uh, up at Epi at ESPN with uh, with Chris Mortensen uh, passing away at the age of uh, of 72 uh, over the uh, over the weekend. Uh, which was a very sad story, and you saw that all throughout the NFL yesterday with the combine going on. And one of the combine winners, uh, without question, uh, is wide receiver for LSU, Brian Thomas. Uh, now, we know Malik Neighbors and Jaden Daniels decided they are not going to work out. They're saving up and going to, uh, to work out at LSU's Pro Day, which is coming up at the end of March. Um, and look, there's a lot of love out there for Malik Neighbors, man. It is not hard to find people that are backing Malik Neighbors uh, from a talking head standpoint. This is not chatter on teams trying to put smoke out there to keep Marvin Harrison around for later picks. This is people out there that are really debating on whether or not who is the best wide receiver in the league. And you hear some of these cats break it down that do this for a living. And you can see where people are torn. And this is the same thing like we were talking about in hour number one. I don't want to discredit, you know, I was not discrediting Caitlin Clark at all. She's a fan, you know, fantastic, phenomenal player and will always be thought of one for that. You know, and wh while you're talking about somebody else, you don't want to discredit anyone else. I mean, Marvin Harrison, what a play, whoever gets him is going to get a potential a potential all pro, a potential Hall of Famer. I mean, you know, just with his his capabilities. And there's real debate on who to take, whether it's him or or neighbors. So neighbors is gonna in the discussion is maybe the first wide receiver off the board. Uh Jaden Daniels feels like he's in the discussion as maybe the number one pick. Now, it feels like Caleb Williams and the Chicago Bears are are are, are heading down the aisle together. Uh, but but Daniels is is a name that consistently pops up in the top three. Uh, you'll you'll have a chance to see those guys at the end of March. Brian Thomas, ne you never heard from him. And and look, from from a guy that's from Bat, you know, right outside of Baton Rouge, he's from Walker. Came to LSU, played for three years. Now going through the draft process. I mean, we can all agree Thomas a pretty quiet guy. Right? I mean, we've all heard the story. He was the game's MVP as a true freshman, as a freshman in high school, for the Class 5A state championship game. As a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a freshman, he's, the, he's the, the MVP of the game. He goes on to become one of the country's best wide receivers at Walker, one of the state's best players. I mean, I remember Will Wade. When he was when he was coaching LSU, and we were talking about state's prospects, when Brian Thomas was like a junior in high school, and was like, "Who who are you looking at?" And it was Jalen Cook, and he would go there to watch Jalen Cook play, 
and he would say, you know, the the the, the bad part about it, he's not even the best player on the team. We we're talking about Cook, and then he would say, in all in all honesty, Thomas is the best player in the state, but he's not considering playing basketball. So I mean, to give you an idea of the athleticism that Thomas had in high school, he he was arguably the state's best football player, and according to the the state university's head basketball coach during his prime recruiting year, he called him the, the state's best basketball player. So he goes on to lead the country in touchdowns and become the best number two wide receiver. That I mean, like, I don't even consider Jefferson... Yeah, that's where you get into the debate. See, because I can't, I kind of, I mean, the numbers say he's a one A, right? You know, so I mean, he was. If you throw that team out the window, I mean, the numbers say Brian Thomas is a one A. Yeah, seventeen touchdowns. He led the country in touchdowns. That's true. But so. if you had to, I mean, that's not a bad problem to have. If you're LSU, you go down the list of Jarvis, LaFell, Bo, Early Doucette, like whoever you want to put, Debbie Henderson, whoever you want to put at that two mark for those years. Oof. You know, Jarvis. And then you can obviously fast forward to Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. Like, that's LSU. That's, that's why they're starting to get that run as wide receiver U because, I mean, this is going to be another class where you put out potentially two first-round picks at wide receiver. And, I mean, you, you don't get it wrong with either one that you take. Obviously, Malik is the clear-cut one as far as draft goes. But in college, I mean, Brian Thomas pretty much did everything you would ask. If Malik wasn't there, he would be a one on pretty much any other team. I mean, you saw it in the bowl game. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Malik was there, but, he went but there. it was the BT show. Right. I just think that he is going – the potential of him in, in one of these offenses in the top 20 of putting him alongside a dynamic quarterback and or another dominant pass catcher is – I mean, the potential of Thomas in the first – you know, in his first contract – is scary to think about just because of the the type of athlete that he is. I mean, the 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 four three he clocked. Third First pass. off, he slips off the he slips off the the the, the start. I mean, he kind of stumbles. Here it is, right there. And then like, look, <laughs> he's gliding. So I'm saying, keep going. See, sometimes I wish they would keep that clock going. Like, obviously, stop before the forty. But half of them are going faster that next. 10, 20 yards coming right. off the the line. That's where you see, like, obviously they're doing a 40-yard dash because it's what that's what it's always been, but it's to see, basically it's simulating a go ball, I would assume, like their first, you know, 25, 30 yards off the line. That's when you're getting, like, those are the big play yards. But for Brian Thomas, if you look at when he's getting going after at 45, 50 yards, that's game-breaking speed, which I can take any ball you throw me to the house. Like, that could be a slip screen, anything. It doesn't take very long for him to get going, and then when he does, he pulls away from people. And I, I don't know if you got the whole Brian Thomas experience just because of how quickly it happened. Yeah, like, his right. freshman, sophomore like year it was flashes, but the junior year was like, oh, I could see why they put together a plan for him to come back, but you also had to know that, brother, if he gets on the big stage, like, if he gets to the combine... I think he's pretty much betting on himself. He's going to make first round money and be a first round pick. Right. And I mean, I would love to see him in this LSU offense because you needed proven pass catchers. They got some through the portal, but I think if you had inserted him into the lineup with Chris Hilton, Brian Thomas, like Aaron Anderson, that just gives you so much more stability. Instead, they had to go to the portal route, which I'm sure people are going to be interested to see how that works into LSU and what they do going into 2024. Yeah, no, Brian Thomas is in a great spot, man. I mean, really. And I, I really believe that he's played himself into the third best wide receiver in this draft. I mean, really by the numbers. And then you turn on the film of, you know, him in 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 every sense of it. I mean, I'm trying to think uh, of. I know he had the drop against Bama, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to think of drop against Bama. He had the like the first down drop, like hit him in the hands, and he dropped mm -hmm. it early in the game. But then he didn't drop any more after that. Talking about this year, yeah, he he really was he was real quiet against Bama this year. I think Bama kind of put a plan together to take him out the game because Malik hit him early. Yeah, like Malik was hitting him early and often, so I think they they had a plan to just take Brian Thomas out the game. Well, that's typical Saban, right? 
give them one of their weapons, but don't give them right. both of them. Right. Just annoy them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and no, I'm trying to find the just, numbers in yeah, which he, he put up consistent. against Bama. I mean, it, yeah, three catches for 36 yards. Yeah. See? A long 23. And then that's with no, I mean, no Jaden Daniels. He's going to hit you over the head at least once. Mm-hmm. Right. But Malik went off. How about Lad McConkey? Yeah. Mm. He made himself some money. I, feel, I think people still don't believe the time. <laughs> But I just looked at a mock that didn't have Brian Thomas in it. I just don't understand how you can take that somebody. It doesn't have Brian Thomas Yeah, it was in a it. PFF mock. Like, yeah. I was the just the looking for thing, one. The that... crazy thing is he's wide receiver one he's in four. literally <laughs> any, in any four, other three. class. He's the first receiver yeah. off the board any other year. I mean. I mean, it just has to be a, a – almost a, it's almost like a narrative because he wasn't talked about. Like, he didn't have the right. – they had Malik that was always the one. Like Sure. Romeo Odunze, it feels like he could compete with him if you put him up on the same field. Like I wouldn't he's not gonna be the third the third wide receiver taken or the second wide receiver taken just because of the narrative around Brian Thomas, but if that combine didn't open up some people's eyes right. where okay what, I mean, what was the official on McConkey? Four four three nine. Four three nine. Uh he's gonna yep, be like four, three, a, he's nine. gonna go like LA. Yeah. Oh. Rams. oh, of course. I mean that's the new Belichick, right? Of like, give me a short, give me a white wide give receiver. Give me a yeah, a twitchy white wide receiver, Cooper but Cup. The, but the Puka, thing, Puka but, Nakua and but Lad. Cooper Cup didn't run four three nine. No, he just like, had none of his latest. Right. White no, they're all big body. Ran four right. three. No. Lad McConkey impressed a lot of people. Like, Did, what's uh, what's Puka run? Puka ran like a four six. Damn, yeah. Puka like had, a four six seven route runner. <laughs> but the thing with Brian, he's gonna. I mean, if he drops, you know, into the middle of the first round, I mean, he's going to go to a situation that's much better than those no top, you know, top five picks. No way he could hang. Yeah, on the KC, I mean, I'm I'm reading this Pro well, Football no, Focus no, one. They have to no trade way. up. Yeah, but I mean, now if he drop, I mean, the Saints are at 14, but I, who knows? He's an LSU player. They're not going to draft him. Uh, Cincinnati's at 18. That would be. That's the. That's the. <laughs> That's the ticket. Wow, that's now that's they, where I want. That's wow. what I now want. Now, if to he happen. doesn't run a four three four, they probably get him. Yeah, yeah. But now it's you. You look at some of these teams from pick eight. Atlanta's going to probably go quarterback. So you have Chicago at nine, Jets at ten, Vikings eleven, Denver twelve, Vegas thirteen. I don't really know if that's any of don't their go needs, to Vegas. But it's probably oh. a position where they're just like he'd be fine though. We, you talking got, about Brian Thomas would yeah. be fine in Vegas? Yeah. I don't have a quarterback. Yeah, but I'm yeah, I think he's like, talking about off the yeah, field. Yeah, like, I'm talking oh, about like from a personal yeah. standpoint. You worry about <laughs> well, that. I mean, you ain't got to worry about that with him. He doesn't even talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be trying to talk to him. Like, <laughs> Home. <so. laughs> but that's what you, when you talk about fit, that's where I get nervous for Jaden Daniels, just for him to be able to go to a place where he can succeed. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have a mock, too. The Washington Commanders and the New England Patriots, and God knows what both those teams look like. The no, Patriots I'm, are a mess. I'm hoping he goes to because the Commanders have Cliff Kingsbury as their OC, which makes me a little bit more comfortable. I mean, obviously he wasn't a very good head coach, but he knows what yeah, he's doing when it comes to definitely. coaching the quarterback position because okay. I don't want him to end up in New England. Me no, either. No. I do no, not want no. him to end up in New England, man. I mean, New England feels like it's a mess. Because really, if he, if he doesn't go two or three, the next place he would end up is – Possibly New York at six. Cause the Giants? The, yeah. Which I wouldn't be mad at. I mean, is anybody watching this Patriots? I am. I mean, it's a, it's a Belichick hit piece. Yeah, it don't, is. Don't, don't get and it he's twisted. on it. He is on it. I don't think he knew. I, I, don't think he, I don't think he knew what the true narrative of it was going to be. Did they think, did they know what the true narrative was going to be? I think they gathered all this information like, I think there's really one direction we can go with this thing. It seems like Kraft does, but one thing is well, for sure now it's, fine, it's his final shot. Is that, I mean, look, man, this thing's all at your desk. Right. I mean, now moving forward, like, no Brady, no Belichick. You're in salary cap hell. You bring aboard a first-year head coach with no experience. That was your inside no linebacker's coach. Wasn't a right? coordinator. And has never seen anything outside right. of New England. Right. It just it feels very just, tenuous. It, it just feels like it, it's. I mean, I, I read somebody was putting out where they're going to interview general manager, potential general managers after the draft. And NFL people are like, that makes it's, it's, zero sense. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, like that makes. I'm zero trying to make sense. draft 
decisions. So, you, you know, know what that I makes me think, know. especially while watching this Patriots the Dynasty thing on Apple TV, uh, is it feels like Robert Kraft wanted some more power. Like it felt like oh, he couldn't gonna, really get past Bill. Well, it sounds like Belichick was just he could he right. built him up to be too big to where he was had almost more control than Kraft had. Right. He did, and now Kraft wants some of that back, and I think he wants to be involved because he was making moves early on before the Belichick era, where he was the guy that came in and signed Drew Bledsoe. Like he was the one that was making these moves to make the Patriots contenders. Right, and then you see all the stuff that happened within the Patriots organization all points back to Bill because he gave him overwhelming control right. and it feels like Robert Kraft is back in this mode again of almost Jerry Jones 2.0 yes. of yeah. I'm my time is almost out I want to do it my way and it that's what I that's the feeling I get after watching a lot of the dynasty and now seeing how they're operating where if you're not going to sign a GM until after the draft you're not going to give Gerard Mayo first time responsibility right. as uh, a GM the Patriots aren't in caps like bad cap space no, they, added, they have actually the second highest cap space they, so they, they can million. spend the most. Like they, they have the second most spending money to spend. Oh, I thought I read that they were in trouble. No, they aren't. They, they don't have. They don't sign anybody to yeah. big contracts. Yeah. So they have the money to spend. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's where you need a GM, also. Right. Yeah. It's just it, that's the that's the part that's head shaking. Is all the decisions that need to be made are GM decisions, and you're not hiring a GM. It's. It's true. I do not want Jaden Daniels no, to go there. No. <laughs> I don't. I mean, it kind of feels like New Orleans. Yeah, and it's and it's in Boston, right? <laughs> oh I yeah, want Jaden Daniels less. in Boston. Right. <laughs> he, he has one bad game. He's right. getting. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, welcome back there. to your. Welcome back to Baton Rouge last year. Right. Like it's just <laughs> get him out. Yeah. And it's like oh, okay now you don't want the eyes of the winner on your team. I mean they, I mean you could even rewind to that year when everybody kind of thought he was just going to leave. I felt like you had one year with Jaden Daniels. Yeah. And then he came back like, oh, well, maybe he might not win the job. Right. And then he takes it and absolutely sprints with it to be in this probably the second overall pick and the Heisman Trophy. I, I think the second half of the season. You saw more. Yeah, I think that the uh, second half of his junior season, yeah. you really saw some signs where you were like, he could use one right. more year. Well, that of stretch of games. Yeah, that stretch where With he o- just. Florida, Ole Miss, Alabama, those three where he just kind of. He took over every game. He did. Oh, yeah. He turned himself. He That's did. when the Heisman he, and, murmurs and he started. Made big play after mm-hmm. big play. And really, the Florida game is when he, he just started launched to throw that it. thing to Malik. Right. And you were like, now, if he'll start doing this, he's going to be a totally different player. And, I mean, you really. You have to credit his development. I oh, mean, man. his 100%. development over the last two years has to be one of the, the 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 most golden egg of a recruiting chip that you can throw on anybody's table. It doesn't even have to be a quarterback. I mean, you can go into a wide receiver, running back, even an offensive lineman's room and talk about the the development that's happening on that side of the ball and show them the Heisman Trophy winner of just, you know, cut-ups of Tennessee, you know, the the game up until Tennessee is junior season to everything after that. I mean, really, the decision-making, the big play capability, the the, the timely plays he would make, the, the just all of it, the mental part, you know, I mean, what, what, what he was seeing, what he was diagnosing and, and being able to watch on the field. And, I mean, it was very NFL-esque, the responsibility he had on that offense and how he every single week would just – he was the best player on every field. I mean, that, and that included Brian Thomas and Malik Neighbors. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, I, I think I, – I think that obviously biasly – that Chicago is making an enormous mistake making Caleb Williams the number one pick if and so that happens. What would you feels do? feels like it's going to happen. If if I had to pick, I would keep Justin Fields. I I think that the quarterback position is such a crapshoot that if you have even a sniff of one that you hold on to it for dear life and try and support that and him 
with everything that can make the offense better by him improving and developing. So a quarterback's coach, a, a heady offensive coordinator, a, 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 an offensive-minded coach like – is it Eberlus? Eberflus. Eberflus. But I think I think Chicago's GM knows what he's doing. He's a former you. player. Yeah. Like he he's been in the you know. What's that? Ryan Poles. Yeah. His name. Um, and he I, I know he understands like the quarterback thing. Like you only get one of these every the, ten it, it, years. It feels like they're not keeping Fields. Yeah. No. I don't. I, mean, I don't think it feels like that. There's a trade gonna, that's pretty imminent that's going to, to happen. And Eberflus is a defensive guy. He was the Colts defensive coordinator. He's always been on that side of the ball. So I'm trying to figure out. Trying to remember who the Bears brought in as their offensive coordinator. But if I'm – I mean, you saw the video that came out with Justin Fields where he was on the phone with his agent and it looked like he was excited about something, which it, I would think that that's a trade that's going to happen on draft day. Like, they want to trade him before draft day so he can get his – get into a camp and be able to, like, learn the offense of where he's going to go. But if I'm Justin Fields, I would take that with bells on. Because oh what God. they've done in, in <laughs> Chicago, it's been in right. almost <clears> – <throat> And the Shane Waldron is who they're I mean, bringing in. He was look, uh, he was with Seattle. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, and that doesn't fit Justin Fields' style. I, I I've watched Seattle play, and their offensive game planning. I is just not think that Chicago style. has yeah. a very unique opportunity right. right now with two picks in the top ten, and in a ideal world, you have a quarterback. It's not as if you are. You know, I mean, it's 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 not like your your Carolina last year, where you're just desperate to get a quarterback. You know, I mean, it's not like some some teams. I mean, like Tampa Bay sitting in a situation. I guess they're giving up on Baker Mayfield, which makes no sense. I don't know. So they just resign Mike, Mike Evans. Mike Evans. Two so are they going to resign Mayfield? I mean, if he, I, from oh, what I yeah, read I that. So. That's what Mike Evans was dependent on if he was going to sign back with the Tampa Bay Bucks, is if they were going to sign Baker Mayfield. They probably both were in cahoots on it. Like, you sign, I'll sign, I sign, you sign. Because Baker, yeah, Baker got caught on camera on the Super Bowl week. He was still mic'd up, and they were going to break. Or, like, he was coming on next, and he was talking to Steve Young. He was, and he was talking about Tampa Bay and how awesome it is. He's like, yeah, I I mean, I, if it's up to me, I'd love to run it back. And this is all, like, not supposed to yeah. be mic'd up. He's like, oh, I mean, I got my career started in Tampa. It's a great place. Yeah. And so I'd imagine he wants to come back. because He played so well last Well, and year, Baker's yeah. one of those guys to where if you give him a chance, he's as loyal as it, it seems yeah. like, like, okay, you gave me an opportunity. I'll come back. I, I just think that the Bears have a great opportunity picking in the top ten, and you have, uh, you know, a, a seemingly a quarterback that I, I don't think you can't win with Justin Fields. I mean, I don't think that it's ideal that you would win immediately with Justin Fields, but he also has shown some life where you're like, hey, man, this is a dude. Like, this is a guy. I mean, he's, he, he's been a dude his whole life. No doubt. And I agree with that. But, I mean, you know, on an NFL level, you gotta you got to see those things up close. And I thought last year he put a lot of film out there that said, put the right tools around this guy. And, I mean, you can't evaluate the Chicago Bears and not look at their offensive line and think – all right, it's not all the quarterback, right? Right. I mean, like, it's not all Justin Fields' fault. But, you know, I digress in saying you got two picks in the top ten, <clears throat> and you got a quarterback on your roster that I would imagine the majority of the league feels like you could probably win with. I mean, what and an you, opportunity. And you picked him this in the draft top 10. is loaded. But, right. but. Also, if you're Chicago, you could, like you said, that quarterback. Everybody in the league knows you can win with him, so you could leverage the. Right, the, I agree. I you agree, could leverage him and say, "All right, I'm going to give you Justin Fields, but I need that first and second pick in the 2025 draft, or right. your first pick in the 2024 draft, and then take it further and get picks in 2025 and 2026." Which I look, I, you know what, the business of the game, go right. get it. And I think a team like Atlanta would be willing to give that up because right now they're desperate, yeah, desperate. for a quarterback. Yeah, they're desperate. And Justin's from Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, like it – and so it would be very fitting for that to be the move that's made. But 
I mean, if you're Chicago, you could flip the first pick and have so many picks. Oh, my God. And just, right, like, this right. is how you build well, you a team. You could be, like, the Dallas Cowboys in the early 90s. Yeah, the Purple People Leaders you trade. You know what I mean? Like, the Herschel Walker trade. Yeah, that's what it is. I mean. Where you just are like, okay, give us enough opportunities to where we can't fuck this up. Yeah, right. I yeah. mean. Because that's the Bears need to, they don't have, what do they have? I mean, who is there? Is it Montez Sweat? their best player on defense? And they got him, what, it's, they got him yeah, last they got year? They got him in a trade from the, Washington. Washington just gave him up. Obviously, DJ Fields. Moore. DJ Moore. DJ yeah. Moore. They got him last year. I really don't know. Who oh, man, they like, got the running back from Texas, Roshan Johnson. Yeah. Eddie He's Jackson's really gone. They released him. Uh, That's what I'm saying, they man. Got a, they got a really good cornerback, Jalen Johnson. Is yeah. His name. And as and he's a rookie, or yeah, he was a rookie last year. So. The, the team that I'm kind of is the Broncos because Sean mm-hmm. Payton, like they're gonna do something. Yeah, because he he wants a quarterback. And, and like, he, he loves Caleb Williams. He loves Williams. I'm sure he, he loves, loves Jaden. Well, he he loves he loves Caleb Williams because of what happened with Mahomes. Right. Yeah. Like he sees so much of the same. Like you can see the where the arm talent is very comparable to kind of how they make plays on the yeah. run and what they do. Where it's like, oh my god. Right. And if that's if you get a second shot at what he deems to be another version of Patrick Mahomes, he's he might gonna, sell the farm. Yeah, he's gonna something's gonna happen because he's taking a quarterback. I, I I I would not be surprised. I think you're right. Or what will what could also happen is that after the draft, if he doesn't get a quarterback, look, I tried I tried to move up and get him. I wanted my guy. I right, couldn't do it. Like right. they would, you know. That's Sean Payton special of after yeah. he's successful, he's like, well, I thought he was going to be good too. <laughs> he's always he's always second to the table for these things. And people are like, Sean Payton knows quarterback now. Well, he missed, I mean, he he missed Mahomes by a pick. A right. Pick. Well, he just got superseded. They saw them move and Andy then the Reed. Chiefs move. Yeah. Andy Reid. Mm. I mean. That would be a different world. A whole different world. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Saints with, but yeah. I mean, Sean Payton would still be here. Winning. 100%. With Patrick Mahomes. Like four or five. He's a cheat code. So, I mean, Jaden could end up in Denver if he misses on, if he's not able to get the first pick. Jaden called him a guru. Where's Denver at? They have the. Dem- Denver has a 12th pick. Yeah, the 12th pick. But see, he's, I, he's, not, gonna, he, he's not sticking at 12. Yeah. No. <laughs> that's, that's why he's trying that's to get. no man's land. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, the quarterback you end up with 12 is. Yeah, JJ McCarthy. McCarthy. <laughs> or Michael Pitts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. J.J. McCarthy throwing left. Yeah, J.J. Horrible McCarthy. throwing left. Seem, he's high-fiving everybody right. in the combine. Can't throw left. Or Big Peyton, team guy. Peyton just waits Big on Big hardball uh, guy. Peyton I don't waits even. on Joe Milton in the third round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's something he would do, too. But, I mean, J.J. McCarthy has got to. I mean, if he went to play for Sean Payton, he would hate his life. Oh, my God. He would oh. make him quit. Oh, yeah. Man. This is oh big national championship, huh? Yeah. This is the guy. He'd be, yeah. he'd be an analyst for Michigan very quick. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> trade me to Los Angeles <laughs> yesterday. He'd be a scouting for the Chargers. scouting department for the Chargers. <laughs> right, go find your buddy, whoever was writing scouting with the manifesto for Michigan. It would be second in command. Uh, Sports Illustrated has J.J. McCarthy going six overall to the Giants. That is <laughs> insane to me. No. That's amazing, man. I, I, that can't happen. keep Daniel Jones over J.J. McCarthy. All day. They're the same person. All day. I mean, Why would you I, do the same thing I'd again? I'd the Paisan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Cutlets. Uh, Tony DeVito. Yeah, 100%. Tommy. Tommy Cuts. Tommy Boy. Yeah. Yeah, at, least it, at least it was fun. Yeah, he's yeah. starting for the Giants on Sunday. What do you want from me? What do you want, huh? Hey, me? I'm still we going here. To church, and then we go into the Meadowlands, huh? <laughs> but I guess we should get to these questions that we put into the chat. Oh, we yeah, talk about LSU spring ball. We have a a couple in here because I think that's when you talked about the Jaden Daniels and the coup that essentially Joe Sloan formed for himself about being able to recruit and being able to develop from going from junior to senior year. I think that's where a lot of people are going to probably highlight like quarterback play. Mm-hmm. Not only is it going to be in like on Garrett Nussmeyer in a sense, but also what that's almost how you got Bryce Underwood. Ashton Larson's a stud. He gets a hit again. I mean, six hundred. That's great. Um, no, I'm with you. I mean, I think that this spring, yeah, you're you're definitely looking at the quarterback, and here comes another wave of a group that you'll be able to tell the development, right? And I thought that Garrett Nussmeyer showed uh, extreme development from the Southern game last season to the bowl game, right when he played against Georgia. You know, I thought that he was one of the bright spots of development when you thought, you know, and, and clearly I think when you talk about Nussmeyer's development, I think it goes into just his decision-making. 
I mean, you know, the way he's he throws it around in the bowl game, mm -hmm. he's always been able to do that. I mean, you remember his first – when they put him in against Arkansas with, <laughs> with like, Ogeron and them. Right. <laughs> they the rolling the best. left. The third of the in the back of the end zone. Oh, <laughs> throws it up. Was that the best? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're like, this kid's going to be – be wild. It's gonna be right. a wild ride. So I mean, to see him in the bowl, where you know now he's a veteran on the field making those plays, was was you know cool to see. But the development on Nussmeier is his decision making. Is just the way he, you know, protects it. The way he he, he you know distributes. Uh, and the, so the leadership, like especially in the game against Wisconsin, I mean, there were two times he was down fourteen points, yeah. and never did he turn back yeah. into the, you know, the gunslinger that everybody had labeled him. I think he gets and that's where I'm interested to see if he doesn't lead a ninety what eight yard touchdown drive. It's where people are with Dustmeyer because I feel like a lot of what people are like the hype around Dustmeyer is because he came back and won that game. Yeah. And you look at the numbers, yeah. you can tack on a hundred to it because, I mean, who did they who did they play? I'm already blanking on who Wisconsin. Else. Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin just, I mean, shit the down their leg with 98, with what, less than two minutes to go, and they, they just yeah. never even put up a defense because I guess they assumed that LSU was going to score and they were going to be able to score too and they go out and win it. But Al Ball Why was – wouldn't they? Yeah. Well, you get, you get a stop. You get a Greg Penn sack at the right time. Yeah. But that's where I'm interested to see is like so much of the dialogue around us is because of how he played in the bowl game when you – I mean, you go through that, and then you're through two and a half quarters of this LSU offense wasn't really doing a whole lot, and then you kind of flip the script in the in the fourth quarter where, okay, he throws for over 300 yards and three touchdowns. You're like, okay, this looks good, which I think he will be good, but it was your first. I mean, all of that, everything that LSU hyped up to be on offense is all pointing to the bowl game because that's the only time you saw yeah. Sloan and Hankton together, and they're like, oh, oh, look, they won the bowl game. Yep. Saw Nussmeier just start, oh, look, look, they won the bowl game. Like, that, that game was – it's kind of the impetus for everything you're seeing that LSU has done offensively moving forward. And I think it'll look different. You've heard about LSU. I mean, you don't have Jane Daniels there to run the football and be your leading rusher on, on the offensive side of the, of the ball. So you're going to have to find a bit, whether it be Caleb Jackson, Josh Williams, Caden Durham, mm. whoever you want to put it running back, but you're going to have to run the ball more than 28. Yeah. Yep. It's going to be very obvious. 28. And then I feed think, him. I think you'll Big see boy. a ton of Mason feed also. Him. Yeah, Mason, Mason Taylor? Taylor. Yeah, like that's. I mean, he. I think he had his highest offensive output in the Nussmeyer game. I also think you'll start to see the the Pimpton mm -hmm. mm -hmm. trade kind of coming in. I don't know about trade immediately. I think that you know. I mean, I remember how high we were on Pimpton last season, right? I mean, nothing you happened, know, and, and really kind of coming into this offense, and it, you know, there, there's something to be said about the transition. Still, I mean, there's some positions that are still easier than others. You know, I expect Caden Durham to come in and play. Yep. You know, I mean, if if Jelani Watkins runs like that, I mean, he's a four to six play a game type guy where you just flip him the ball. I might just put him at returner. Right. I mean, even just, though you just, have speed like that with Chris Hilton, I mean, if they're if they're wowed by Chris Hilton, I mean, if they're wowed by Brian, Brian Thomas, Thomas, wait till <laughs> right, Chris Hilton right. gets there next year. <laughs> I mean, well, they're going to be like, jump where's this and guy faster? been? <laughs> and then yeah, he they runs faster, that, jumps they higher. They thought that 4-2-2 two, two looked good. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. Seriously. Like Chris Hill, no 4 19. The only thing about the 4-2s, and the 4-2 is one of the most impressive speeds in any sport, in anything. Anybody who clocks it legitimately deserves to be. Praise. I mean, that's crazy. But, right, who's the only one that's been a I mean, like, is there a player out of them? Like, I know John Ross held the record for a while. Chris Johnson is the only one right. that I can think of that clocked a 4-2 that turned out to really make waves in the NFL. And by waves, Johnson had a heck of a career. 2,000-yard rusher one season. I mean, like, he had big-time highlights. CJ2K? Um, but – Yeah, Tariq Woolen. I don't think Tariq, Tariq Hill runs no. a 4 -2, Tariq though. Woolen, the DB for – Did Tyreek run a 4-2? Yeah, like 4-2-4. Officially? I don't, I don't even know if Tyreek was sure. invited to the combine. Tyreke, but I know Tariq Woolen, the that's corner going on. for the safety, he for the Seahawks, he ran a 4-2-6. And he's, and a, he's player. a player. Yeah. 
Okay, Tyreek Hill ran a four two nine. At the official? I mean at the combine? He did not get invited to the combine okay. because of some off the field right. things. He's got some more off the field things. He broke an inst- he broke an yeah. leg at a practice. Or they were making like a video. I just yeah. I just think it doesn't automatically right. make you a player. I right? agree. Yeah. Like, I mean I look at Xavier Wor- I look at Xavier than- Worthy's numbers in college and the fact that he only had five touchdowns to me says a lot. Because right. four two one speed on a college football field is so much faster <laughs> than just about everybody. And I'm talking about it Alabama and LSU and Ohio State included. Right? Like, I mean, if that's how you run. But there's so much of a difference of track speed and putting the pads on and running a straight line or Caleb Downs is going to knock your head off. Five catch, 75 yards on the touchdown against Alabama. Longest longest play was 44 yards. So Impressive. He showed his speed. Well, that's the one catch that he had, the diving catch in the back of the yeah. end zone. Mm-hmm. But five touchdowns? Yeah. Is am, am I am I is that overly critical? No, you aren't freaking no, out. I, mean, like, I, I feel like he, I feel like I remember guy. him having a drop issue this past season. I feel like he had a couple games where there were a couple big drops that he made. Um, I don't. I don't. But, I think he's more of a body catcher than a hands catcher. Yeah. I, I, agree. I just I, mean, I just I think say he's this. More, yeah. yeah, the four two speed doesn't automatically mean that you're the guy, Mm-mm. right? Like I mean, I think like the like Dion and Bo Jackson ran four twos. You know, I mean, like, those those dudes are dogs. They're players, right? I mean, in the same vein, so did John Ross and Xavier Carter. You yeah, know what I mean? Rugs. Right? You know, you know, I mean, like, there's so much more that goes into football than just running, running a 40-yard sprint. Yeah, I mean, for and John—it's a weird testing it is. mechanism for a football. Well, it's player. just something that's become so overblown and enamored. Everybody's just enamored by speed. Like, you want to yeah. see. You think about it. You would see their greatest athletes run fast. That's why Keon right. Coleman is getting dragged for running right, four six, and it's like, well, put on the tape. Yeah, right. and, and he, he ran way faster. There's than a reason why Sean. Yeah. yeah, there's a reason why Sean McVay is not there. <laughs> yeah, like right. this is like I'm not. And getting he'll probably caught. and he'll probably draft Coleman. Right. Yeah, or McConkey. <laughs> no doubt. But, but that's like, why, like, that's because you can get caught up in all of the things that are going on around you, where it's. Oh man, did you see who ran this? And oh, he's the fastest player in the draft, the fastest player ever in the NFL Combine. It's like. Okay, that's how John Ross goes ninth, and right. you never hear. He's already retired. So I think it's better to probably not be around all of that, that you can watch it on TV, or you just say, put on the tape for Xavier Worthy, and what right. do I see? I don't see a first-round pick. I don't care how fast he is. What can he do right. football-wise? Uh, Keon Colvin's a better player, right. but he pro- I don't know where he goes in the draft. I don't know where Worthy goes in the draft, but I almost think it's – Casey. It's out of <laughs> – yep, Maybe. But it's almost not as in vogue as it used to be if you flash a huge 40-yard dash to where people are like, oh, you have to take him now. Um, I mean, it shows up on tape, though. Do you oh, have, absolutely Do it you does. have the video of Jelani Watkins and Caden Durham? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you did not see this over the weekend, speaking of speed. Let's talk about both sides of our mouth. Um, <laughs> well, there is such thing as the, the, the track football player, right? Like, I mean, the track guy tra- trying to play football is usually a tough – is a tough is a tough role. The 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 track player that I mean the track athlete that that is a football player, sometimes you, you see it happen. Caden Durham is a football player that runs track. Right. Yeah. Well, just I mean, look at him. I mean <laughs> my God. I mean like he's easy to tell which one is him. Right. On the starting block. Uh Jelani Watkins does look like a track guy. Don't get me wrong. But if you're coming into LSU's offense and you're Jelani Watkins, you're going to look around and you're going to see playmaker after playmaker after playmaker and realize that your role is going to be very minimum, but it could be seriously explosive. Like the two to three touch a game guy that gets like the 75 yard or explosive play just because nobody sees it coming. It's a creative, great play that you use your speed and you can take a hit, you can you can stick. I don't. Can he? Is he is he a football player as well? Because on this highlight, right. he is clearly a track right. athlete. Right, right, right. I mean, like, Caden Durham stopped by this show and I, sin, like, really disrespected him by saying that there was like a ten seven time, 
And he cut me off like in the minute. He's like, "Cuz I don't know what time you're looking at, bro." Right. Hey, well, that, maybe I was in seventh grade. But I ran. <laughs> he's like, "I ran." What do you say? I ran like a ten three, ten two. Yeah, something? and a ten two eight was the last yeah. one they had clocked at. And it's like when dated. He's like, I, "That don't matter. That don't mean anything to me." It's a ten two. And he Not a made <laughs> Kate, Jelani Watkins in this video. Makes Caden Durham, which Caden Durham. You know, tell me which one right. is Caden Durham. <laughs> Looks like he's wearing. Pads. I lost Jelani Watkins the first time I watched. So did it. I. And I then was, he I was looking. I was like, comes out of a cannon. Like, see ya. He's not even in the frame. You can't keep him in the frame. Oh, God. that's moving. Like, moving. That is so fast. <laughs> I mean, if you like, if you have you heard the audio on this call. No. It's unbelievable. Like, they're even, the people in the booth like, oh, my God, here comes Jelani Watkins. They're like, oh, go, go. Because it's just that type of speed wherever you see right. it. It's yes, hard not it's to be enamored with. They're like, okay, because that's as fast as it gets He's probably. bouncing off of the track. That's probably the high school elite, right? I would yes, say Jelani. Yeah, I mean, Texas. Yeah, it's Texas track. The Texas State Relays in college are as big as it gets that's outside of anything <clears throat> you see outside of the Olympics. Like, where you see real legitimate Every bit, Oregon goes there, LSU goes there, mm-hmm. Texas hosts it, yeah. and it's and those are all guys that want to go to schools like that. This in high school, that Texas track thing is legit. I and mean, for yeah. Jelani to be, what, three steps ahead of everybody else that's supposed to be the best he of the really state? He was flying on that. Like, I don't know if it's – I don't think you can – words can put into perspective how fast it is. I mean – No, not at all. I mean, Caden Durham is a world-class sprinter. He was two steps faster than him in that. I don't know. I don't know if Caden Durham's ever been beat like that. No, I, I doubt. Is that it. The, I mean, there's, there's no way. There's no way. I mean, I, I, I would be anxious to ask him that. Right. Like, was that 100 meters? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So 100 meters is 109 yards. So I guess you won't see that. I mean, when he gets going, he's probably what 60 yards down the field. Yeah, yeah. So he'll probably be past everybody at that point. But that's what I don't know how. That's what is track for his football. I like mean, his last... he essentially <laughs> runs a football field in ten point two seconds. Still, some of the finest highlights of all time is Trendon Holiday mm. hitting a crease. Oh, some I mean, of the best he, calls of all if time. If he hits, if he hits a hole, right, and and you you're know, not going to catch happens, him, folks. You're not touching him. Yeah, that, I mean, it's just even like in the AFC title game, <laughs> the Baltimore Ravens were chasing him. Right. I mean, if for what Jelani Watkins does on tape, I've watched his huddle. It's a lot of go balls, but he's sure. also not afraid of contact. Yeah, like they throw him some slip screens, they throw him some like underneath stuff. But his primary focus, as of now, is hand up. Yeah. Who who did LSU have in the boat that was from Florida? Remember the other speed guy that they brought in, and then he decommitted kind of at the last second. When? Last year. Oh, Jalen Brown. Oh, Jalen yeah, Brown. Brown. Kind of in he, that same mold. No, he came in and then left. Transferred. Yeah. What do you go, Florida State? Yep. Mm-hmm. And then if I don't know if you saw Kyle Parker working, mm. yeah, that I think if you have a pick yeah. of people like if we're going to play the sleeper. the poll game that we, that that we put out there, Kyle Parker is my pick to come in and make an instant impact as soon as he's able to get his hands on the ball. Wait, is he an inside guy? Yeah, he's just Maybe. the way he's built. Yeah. Mm. I, I, don't, I think he could play either. I really, I was about to say I'd probably move him around just because of his, his size doesn't limit him to just yeah, being inside. All. Because I mean, bit, he's he's put together. Like yeah, he's he not, looks a bit like Malik. Yeah. yeah. If we if we talk this inside, I'd go like just Aaron Anderson, uh, Xavion Thomas. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's probably like your inside yeah. receiver. And you have C.J. Daniels and Kyron Lacey on the outside. Chris Hilton will probably get some run, like inside outside. Yeah. And then Mason Taylor, like I said, is also going to be somebody. Well, while the forgotten man, yeah. because of how Jaden played, I think you'll see that little come back. And you'll see Mason Taylor probably with a career year. Yeah. yeah. And this could be his – I mean, like, could he's, be probably, his last year. he's probably year. looking around and oh, yeah. saying, like, if I have a big one, like, right. I'm gone. Yeah. Like, I don't look like these other I mean, two fellas these in here. freaks in here. <laughs> yeah, what happened Trey, to my tight end room? And, <laughs> yeah, right. and that's crazy to say because I'm the right. son of a Hall of Famer. No right. Like, and I've produced. I've been here for right. three years. Yeah. In the biggest moments. Like, yeah, uh, Florida State, uh, Alabama. Like, it's just – I'm not 6'7", 240 pounds. But he's, I mean, he'll get drafted. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. And be a and fantastic pro. Oh, you yeah. know how hard it 100%. is to do what he did? Oh, man. Coming as a freshman, and then he gets, you, 
he's the one that they put kind of the entire offense on right. because of how much went into, hey, we're a we're a tight end based <laughs> offense, and it's like we don't have a tight end. Yeah, how yeah, yeah, yeah we do. I mean, you had Brian Kelly dancing for guys. Yeah. yeah. Oh God, uh, he saved our lives. I mean, and really, that, truly, and, and Mason he, Taylor saved us. He danced for a kid that is on, buried on the depth chart. Buried. Alabama. Like. Haven't heard from Danny Lewis since. He, I mean, and I don't mean this, you know, I don't mean it anyway to, to, to Danny Lewis, but he had to look at Mason Taylor's freshman year and be like, "Oh, should have done that." What he am I, what when am he was what, sitting on the sideline, doing and Mason Taylor was catching the game, game winning catches. Winner. Yeah, I mean, touchdown. Like, he just took my job. Because <laughs> I mean, tough I mean feeling. not even dressed out over I'm here. still fired up about Pimpton. <laughs> yeah, mm. I, I still think. I mean, like the 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 scenario of Pimpton and Tradez Green. <laughs> on the field together is i mean i'm watching this patriot this patriots dynasty and i just finished the hernandez one oh. and it's i mean it's messed up for how screwed up hernandez right. was and like just uh, it was a bad situation and by no means like throw like the hernandez but when Hernandez and Gronk were on the field together. Crazy. It was a it was like an offense that like revolutionized football that people were just like, We don't know what to do. <laughs> we're going back to two tight ends. We don't we, we have no idea what to do. We have no idea what to do. And I know that LSU is gonna have a lot more freaks on the team than Pimpton and Green, but to have those two cats on the same field in the same formation, whether you know they're juniors or they're freshmen, I don't care. I mean, is crazy. <laughs> they're gonna about. be. They're gonna be somewhere that no one else can touch. I don't like. Like the, the, it's such a commodity that I'm sure there has been, but I know LSU has not right. had something like this where you could put onto the field, a, including what what LSU has the playmaking spots. Right. Like, I mean, you will have true. If you're a defensive coordinator, what am I going to do? Who right. do I? What What do you do? And then you got Caleb Jackson in the backfield. <laughs> And, and you got Caden Durham, Durham in the backfield. You got yeah. Harlem Barry in the backfield. You got James Simon yeah, the in the off, backfield. This offense, this offense, Bryce streak, Underwood. This offensive streak that LSU's on is not stopping anytime soon. It's amazing to think about. That's the only thing that gives me the the calm peace of mind that Bryce Underwood right. is sustainable to hang on to for a year. Right. Is that you're like, look, Bryce. LSU may not be able to offer the big market money that USC or Miami or some of these schools would offer, but they, they also they also don't have I mean eight first linemen. round picks right. that you're going to be playing with. I mean, like uh, elevate, elevate, Heisman not Trophy even top not, three I, pick. we hadn't even gotten to the offensive lineman. Right, you didn't even mention an offensive lineman, and they might be the most talented group out of everybody. <laughs> Like, out of all those guys, they might have the most pros and potential, like, right. long-term guys. Matt House. So See good ya. our defense is trying to steal them. Right. <laughs> right. But that's why you had to bring in Blake Baker. Right. You yeah, can't you have that happen again. No. Yes, exactly. It became a fireball. Well, I mean, I think that Brian you... Kelly could, like, when he's, you know, he's on the golf course and he's looking back at his career and – you get to a point where you're like, I mean, like he knows this better than anybody. You're 35 years into a trade. You know, things come along very rarely, right? Like, I mean, I remember Johnny Jones talking about coaching Shaq. Like the day that he left, like like Dale Brown like brought him in and was like, fellas, never in your life again, right? ever in your coaching career, will you get an opportunity to what we just did the last three years. So, like... Hope you soaked it all right. in. You know what I mean? Like, hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys had a great time because that that's it. Like, now you got to go find another one, have another experience, but that's what it is. You got to look back at this offense if you're a right. head coach at some point in your career and be like, holy cow. Like, what what, what, what happened? And the defense couldn't stop a soul. Right. Gave up 35 points a like, game. Could not stop Wisconsin. They had some goofy white dude back there that hadn't thrown for three hundred in three years. Like in all of his starts combined, he hadn't started. He hadn't thrown for no. four. He chopped up LSU's defense like he it was like a six, video. He game. had like six touchdowns on the year. <laughs> I mean, like he had three against LSU. Yeah, tell These my are, grandkids about this. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Especially if LSU gets back to prominence oh, on yeah. defense, he's going to be like, oh, I diced LSU up. I like, diced that defense up. Uncle Tanner, no, you didn't. Yeah, right. yeah, Put the film on. Yeah. 
That's not the same. <laughs> YouTube's movie. still around? <laughs> yeah. Relax. Pull it up. Relax. Relax. Quest Bowl uh, 2024. <laughs> that's right. Pull he threw up. for 189 no, yards. You know Perkins is, huh? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's him in the middle. <laughs> Listen to these games. Mordecai against Buffalo, 189 yards. Against Purdue, 174 yards. Against Rutgers, 145 yards. Against Iowa, good Iowa team. Good Iowa defense, good 106 defense. yards. Ugh. Against Nebraska, 160 yards. Against Minnesota, 145 yards. Against Jeez. LSU, 378 <laughs> yards and three touchdowns. Wow. Jeez. <laughs> Man, that house. I think I might come back. <laughs> I probably turned the quarter, says Tanner Mordecai. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Mr. Mordecai? <laughs> Mr. Mordecai. He's like, he's like uh, old, uh, our guy at Oregon. Bo Nix. Bo Nix. I'll do another year if I don't want to do another year. year. Apparently, he had a terrible combo. No. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> JJ McCarthy, I Bo Nix, they're all going to be the let's same. Let's not forget the four years that Bo Nix spent at Auburn. Yeah, I mean, we forget. I, I, Tore how, up LSU. How quickly do they forget? I mean... Should have won the Heisman. Yes. Yeah. SEC Should Freshman of the Year. Uh, yeah, give that back to Stingley. Yeah. <laughs> Please. It's like giving Reggie Bush's Heisman back. Like, come on. Like, you saw Manziel? Manziel yeah. boycotting the Heisman. Yeah, Good he for said him. He's not going back. Good for him. Does until, he have that kind of pool? Until Reggie Bush. He does. I don't know if he does. Ah, but I, don't I, support know if he does. The, I support the But I hope it kind of like, causes a. A stir. Yeah, yeah, See, I mean, I hope it who, who, a who has the pool? I was think? about to say, yeah, who has the pool most recently? I think it recently? could create momentum. Burrow. I think, like, you would have to get, like, that class of, like, to me, the face of the Heisman is, like, Desmond the, the Woodson, Desmond yeah. Howard, like, that era. Reggie would you probably be I mean? the. Yeah, I mean, oh, I, the fact that Reggie Bush is not in that room is a crime. I mean, Reggie Bush potentially is the greatest college football player ever. 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 <laughs> ever. I mean, like, Full stop. At, at the very least, give him his Heisman back. At the very least, give him his Heisman back. Do you back. think Matt Leinert hops on this train? I would think so. Yeah. That's true. yeah Should have been his idea. Yeah. yeah. Gotta, I mean, gotta support his guy. I mean, I would think that all of, like, I would think Marcus Allen. You know, yeah. OJ's in. <laughs> <laughs> Call me in. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean where are we? Hell yeah. I'll do what it. did he do? Johnny, I've been trying to get in touch with you, Bush. Yeah. What did yeah. He, yeah, here. He can have mine. He's an SC guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Be, like, be like, what did Reggie do? Yeah. What did he do again? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I got a story for y'all. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> y'all mean, took it for that? Wait, wait. hang on. They got his. <laughs> y'all don't know who I am, right? I did 17 years with a pen. If I were to do it, this is how I do it. Yeah. Not saying I did. If I, I mean, were to give I, Reggie I, I his Heisman back. Anybody who played in that era has got to be like, get, I mean, right. get, give him his I mean, What are you doing? For God's sakes here. I he mean, had the second highest amount of Heisman winning votes behind him. He should have been unanimous. Joe Burrow, he had 91% of the vote. I mean, you could argue Burrow should have been unanimous. I mean, Bush had a Burrow-type year. At that Every point, USC I mean, game you watch, right. he, he was... It was something I'm happened. I'm telling you, he was Fresno State, UCLA, Texas. Like you put mm. it on the put it, Hawaii, Hawaii. You just tuned too. in the Fresno State Notre game. Dame. Oh yeah, good luck. You know the I Bush mean, push. Even I'm telling you, in the Texas game, he had a terrible game because he got all up in his head after he flipped the ball back early. He got a little mm. too cocky. Love the move. Got a little. It was a great move. <laughs> it was a great move. And, and if he catches it, he's gone. Oh, he's, he's, he's a hero. Gone. Yeah. He's gone. He just put it to the wrong guy. It's the white tight end who's down there looking for work. He was. looking for a body. Out of the whole roster. <laughs> the whole roster, this guy. Where's like, Dwayne where, Jarrett? Where's Dwayne Jarrett, exactly. <laughs> I mean, where, is, where are these guys at, dude? And so Mike Williams, are you like here? He's like on his head. And if you remember, like late in the game, they they went for it on fourth down. They didn't even have Bush on the field. Lindell White, fourth and five. Yeah, mm -hmm. but like they didn't even have him on the field. Yeah. And like the guy in the booth, I think it's Bob Greasy. It's like Al Jackson. I mean uh, Keith Jackson. Is oh calling the game. Nelly. Yeah, I mean he's calling the game, and whoever's the color guy is like, where is Reggie Bush? Uh -huh. But Bush has a touchdown run. A 20-yard touchdown run where he turns the corner and how he does it still looks impossible. I mean, he's running full speed at the sideline. It's unbelievable. His shoulders are pointed directly at the sideline. And when he turns and cuts up, how he doesn't run out of bounds, blow his knee out, is... And he doesn't step out, cuz. And he, he cuts a, the then he cuts a front flip. And then he <laughs> and he jumps with the ball out and tumbles and stands up. <laughs> I mean, like, if you had forgotten who the best player on the field was. Um You got it, Stewie? Hold on, hold on. He's just watching it himself. He's ever, and 
And you could say that this is the Fresno State. Oh, that game is unbelievable. When he just cuts that, back, that had you. Is that when he does the? That's where he has. Yeah, he has he the is, one and sleeve, he, and he cuts on the sideline. And he thinks he puts it behind his back. Yeah. You you could say he had a bad game. Uh, Reggie had ninety five yards on six catches and gained eighty two yards on thirteen carries. Average thirty uh, twenty yards a touch. In that um, oh, and, and, oh, I'm sorry. And twenty yards on five punt returns. In so we had yeah. They didn't get to him enough. He had two hundred one total yards. They didn't get to him enough. Yeah. Said, but he said that's his worst game of his career. It was. I mean, 200 like, yards. If you watched him play college football. I know. Yeah. That's insane. This. He had 200 total yards and a touchdown. It's like, oh, Reggie lost you the game. It's like, oh. Maybe what game was it end. when he ran the punt back in his sock? Oregon State? I think yeah. so. Pull his shoe off. Yeah, and his like, sock is like flopping <laughs> as it's running. And he, he's still like. He folds he's the still, sock. Like, On the toes. I mean, like, he's still like moving. I'm telling you, he was, he was the best. He was the best. Uh, th- have a great day. Gets, and I think like, he gets lost in the NFL. He does, like man. He does. Yeah. But, I mean, watch somebody else take off from the eight-yard line and score. He, man, walked on air. I mean, it's still some of his NFL highlights, though. Oh, yeah. Like, he has a touchdown in the NFC Championship, NFC championship game. That's fantastic. And the divisional round. He tore up the Vikings oh, he tore and up the Cardinals. the Cardinals. He tore up the Cardinals. Um, he was – he's – in for my, like – Fandom, he's an all-timer. Uh, me too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, all-timer. For sure. All-timer. That is. Uh, his high still school. One of my, still the biggest flop <laughs> Talk about I've stuff. ever had in radio on the, a bungle, oh, bungle yeah. of the interview. He would have mm. been great too. Oh, God. Big. <laughs> I mean, it still like uh, cuts me. Mm. Talk Look. about stop and start. Mm. Yeah, Reggie had it. Mm. Talk about stop and start. That was Jordy with the Reggie interview. <laughs> <laughs> had it started to stop Start it. and stop. Mm. <laughs> That's mm. why you can't sleep, maybe, now. Yeah. <laughs> Keeps him up at night. No, he just wakes on. up at 3 a.m. every morning. He's like, Reggie? <sighs> I thought he called again. I still text the number. It's gone. He's changed it since. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every yeah. 985. Is is big. <laughs> Have a great day. Like, share, comment. We're back with you tomorrow. Friday from 7 to 9. Yeah, you see the notification. We about to go live. We got all your favorite guests. We got them in line. It's the Jordan Collider Show. Come have a good time. It's the hottest show around. We ain't got a flex. Call up G, we get it done. We earning our respect. Tell recruits to let us in. Where they going next? Throw up the L's. Now we lit. Band playing neck. From the boot to the east to the west coast. No matter where we at, we live. Mic'd up for show. Open up the phone lines. Come and join the show. Make sure you tell your friends about Jordan Collider Show. Yeah. Monday through Friday from 7 to 9. Yeah, you see the notification. We about to go live. We got all your favorite guests.